I'm Head of the Curve, also known as James Bergman, and in today's interview I will be talking to Hamza Zorsis about his book The Divine Reality, God, Islam and the Mirage of Atheism. Hamza Zorsis' book presents a much-needed comprehensive account of Islamic theism that draws upon Western and Islamic thought. Hamza Zorsis is an international speaker, writer, and instructor. He has a PG cert and an MA in philosophy and is currently continuing his postgraduate studies in the field. Hamza has studied Islamic thought and theology under qualified scholars. He has delivered workshops and courses on topics related to Islamic thought and philosophy. Hamza has debated prominent academics and thinkers on Islam and atheism. In truth, many viewers of this video may already know Hamza through his debate with atheist Lawrence Krauss, which has grown substantially in views. It's got a few million uh, view counts, I, I believe, on YouTube. And so this is where Islam and, and atheism kind of clashed for one of the first times, if not the first time, uh, online. And it became essentially viral for anyone who's interested in the topic to see. Of course, I will talk to Hamza about uh, that debate and his thoughts on Lawrence Krauss all these years later. Um, we, we delve into a number of topics such as apostasy, uh, controversies around Prophet Muhammad, uh, we, we, we talk about uh, revelation, we discuss truth, critical thinking, and of course the reception of his book from readers, The Divine Reality. He also talks about what he might have changed and what he plans on changing in a potential second edition. And so me and Hamza essentially talk about atheism and Islam and, and philosophy and how to come to rational conclusions. If man can be rational, we talk about so many different things, as you can probably see through the timestamps which are on this video. If you want to skip to any parts that you prefer to watch, then you can do that instead of slogging through the whole three hours and a half or something that there is. And finally, I do want to say, if anybody hasn't read Hamza's book, The Divine Reality, which again, I, I have here, I would highly recommend it. I'm an agnostic atheist and I've read a fair few books on theism. And I must say, even in my position, I was impressed with Hamza's ability to come across in a very clear and crystal way. Even though I didn't just necessarily agree with what he said, I still understood that okay, well, that's an interesting way to view this argument, and so forth. So regardless of whether you happen to be a Muslim watching this, or, or a Jew, or a Christian, or an atheist, I would recommend this book, because it is one of the better books, if not one of my favourites now, on the subject of Islam, philosophy, and, uh, and God uh, in general. And I would even say critical thinking and truth, just to add a couple caveats to that. Hamza really does uh, stretch quite far, and I believe he does this excellently. Leave any comments on the topics that we discuss, and if there's anything that you disagree with Hamza or, or me for that matter, then please let me know. Um, and also, subscribe if you want to see more content on philosophy, religion, literature. I, I do this in the form of interviews like these, and book reviews, and uh, clips, and I am going to branch out in my content to make it more uh, philosophy than literature, um, or maybe just a balance, but there is more to come on this uh, on these topics. So please uh, stick with me, subscribe if you want more of this kind of stuff, uh, if you want more interviews like this. Uh, and finally, just remember to, to, to like and share um, YouTube. You know how it is with the algorithm. Um, liking really helps me out, really helps out the channel. So please, please uh, leave a like if, you, if you're enjoying it, of course. It's a very dense conversation at times, but I think that the timestamps available will make things slightly easier. Enjoy the video, let me know what you think, leave a like, subscribe if you want more from me. Let's get into the discussion. Hamza, great to have you on the podcast. Thank you for having me, James. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I, I, I must say, your book, The Divine Reality, I, <laughs> I, I, I loved it. Um, I, I've read a number of books on theology um and you know from, from atheists and, and and theists um not many on islam though which i want to try and improve on um but i i i would categorically say i'm not just saying this because i'm talking to you right now but, but i was thoroughly impressed with 
with how you wrote this um, and with how critical and philosophical uh, you, you are in the piece. I, uh, it's, it's not like other you know, books that I was reading weren't necessarily like that, but I feel like the way that you put the ideas across and not only that as well, but the, the fact that, and now this is really something that I was, I was like, this is great. I, I love the fact that you, uh, uh, most of the time throughout the book, you posit what your interpretation is or what your thoughts are. You don't only do that. You then say, oh, what are the counter arguments to that? And you go through what the atheist could possibly say back. Um, and, you know, even the Christian, let's say, if, if it is to do with um, some sort of um, conflict there between, between the theisms. And so I found that to be very unique. And, uh, and, and also the thing is, it can go very wrong because what you can do is straw man. You, you, you can make up this kind of, you know, false, false um, argument that the atheist or the typical atheist, let's say, wouldn't necessarily say or it's been misconstrued. But you didn't. And I, I was just like, that is great. And it just really helped me kind of be like, oh, so you've already cleared that up. Um, OK, so what else do I have an issue with or, or in your let's say in your response to that argument, it kind of moves things along forward in a really healthy way. So, I, I mean, that's just one thing that I that I really loved about the piece, just how critical you are in it. Um, and I. I also, not to go on a tangent, but I also, again, it's just how you, how critical it is and also um, the, the, the format and, and I also like how at the end, and you didn't try and you didn't do this at the beginning, because if you introduced Islam at the, at the very beginning, if you tried to introduce Muhammad at the beginning, then maybe, you know, people might feel uh, a bit more distance because they are with their presuppositions um, and they might want to give up there and then. But I think it was a really good idea that you actually put it at the, at the, at the end because kind of how it worked for me was and I think this is probably what you were trying to do it was like okay well if you agree with up to here um if you if you're on board then okay well here is the next step it, it is quite literally Islam and introducing uh Muhammad um and 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 sort of his life and that was just really cool I, I enjoyed that um so yeah hopefully it wasn't too much of a tangent I just wanted to genuinely say how much I enjoyed this piece and how honestly impressed I was and this is at the moment my favorite book um on I, on the philosophy of religion it, it, it's just it's just really really good um so I just want to say congratulations for for writing it I guess and and thanks for putting your 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 word out there in written form I, it's it's great yeah um well, uh, I, I don't know how to respond. That's probably one of the most, uh, I'm speechless. Thank you very much for that introduction. I mean, look, at the end of the day, I think it was Ernest Hemingway that he said that, you know, writing is easy. You just go to your typewriter and you bleed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And sure. another, another friend of mine, he described writing, I think, it, I think he described it in this way, which was, it, you know, writing is fine. It's like walking on the streets uh, naked, right? Because you expose yourself. So if you combine those two statements together, it's uh, it's like walking in public and bleeding at the same time. And that is probably one of the best ways to describe writing nonfiction. Hmm. Because there's things that I had to not include, things that I felt maybe should be included is it the is it the final product? No, because with all nonfiction, you're going to have a second edition, a third edition, and it's going to continue as someone grows and develops. But the reason I want to start off like this is to say that that book is basically a product of many mistakes. I made many mistakes. So when I started in the field of trying to articulate Islam, as you can see in the preface, when I talk about, you know, in the beginning, I was just almost mirroring Christian philosophers and theologians. And then I just found my own space and I started accessing the Islamic tradition in a more serious way. And, you know, the whole book really was as a result of me delivering certain courses on the topic. And many of the chapters were literally a cut and paste of my slides. And then I would just basically write it in prose and start to think about it. 
And, you know, I'm not a great writer and it takes time to write an essay or a chapter or a book that is structured well, that deals with objections and contentions but even in saying that, you know, it took me around three years and a good part of nine months within those three years, it was because I broke my smartphone. I was in the gym and a heavy dumbbell just hit the phone. And I was like, this is a good sign. And for, from what I remember, I didn't have a smartphone for nine months. I didn't even have a phone. I mean, I had maybe a very, very basic phone for family that you could hardly do anything with it. And I wouldn't use it all the time. So I was really, in I, I, no one could access me from that perspective, I was just focused on the book. Um, and yeah, so it was, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a tough time writing it. When I first published it, it was like, oh my God, there's so much more I wanna add and so much more I want to improve. And there's so many things that I want to maybe unpack. And maybe, you know, I had my own assumptions, but I didn't really spell them out or articulate, articulate them properly in the book itself. And for me, I like, one of my weaknesses as a personality is, I really hate being misunderstood. It's like, if you want to basically trigger me or I feel internally upset or some form of anguish, you just basically misunderstand me. I hate being misunderstood for some reason. I need to unpack why. There's probably many reasons why, but you know, and the book itself is my ideas or ideas that I believe to be true. And you know, sometimes when I get a question from someone and they say, oh, what do you mean by that word? I'm like, man, I should have, explain that word properly another two sentences at least so they really know what's going on mm. and for me even to this day I mean I've learned to deal with it a little bit more a little bit more maturely now because uh, you know otherwise it would be it would have destroyed me but even now I still have in the back of my, of my mind so many things I want to improve concerning the book because you know with, with anything in life it's always a journey isn't it it's not a final destination and there's so much more I want to maybe unpack and articulate because you say the book's philosophical, but during this journey and up to now, I'm a PhD student now, and I had, I've got three postgrads in philosophy. I'm not saying that to blow my trumpet. I'm just saying that when I'm looking back at the book now, mm. there's so much more philosophy that you can add and so much nuance and so, much, uh, so many different types of perspectives. It would be impossible to put all of the kind of uh, knowledge around these topics in one book. So there's things that you're gonna miss out and there's things that you're gonna deliberately miss out and there's things that you're going to mention uh, without giving too much justification. And you're going to decide to focus on certain key things. Because for me, I wanted the book to be conceptual. I didn't want to the book to be, okay, you know, this is going to be a reference point from the point of view that this is all I need. No, this book is part of someone's journey. But the conceptual framework, if you like, of all the arguments is there. Like, I believe I could defend those, the conceptual framework of each chapter in any court of law. Yeah, legal, philosophical, whatever the case may be, social, Twitter space, whatever you want. Hopefully, I, I believe that I could defend the outline of the argument. And that's why I want, wanted people to internalize the, the underlying basic conceptual framework of each chapter. And that's why it's very concept driven, even though, yes, I may use some evidences here and there, whether philosophical, rational, deductive or inductive. But the point is, even if you remove some of that to the side, the conceptual framework in my view of each chapter is intuitive, makes sense to someone who has sound reasoning and it satisfies the human heart. That was the kind of main approach. There's so, there's so, much, so, there's so much more to improve on. And that's why I like having these discussions because from this discussion, one of my hidden agendas that I'm not making hidden anymore <laughs> is to actually learn from you. Cause I've never, I don't think I've ever done this with someone before about the book or about the ideas of the book. Cause I want to improve the book. I want, you know, if I've made a straw man, built a straw man, then so be it. I, I need to fix it. If I haven't clarified something properly, then so be it. If I haven't really represented the other position properly, then I'm definitely going to fi fix it. I, I mean, the, the, the version you're reading is the newly revised edition. Yeah. There was an older first edition that wasn't, that was still good, but there were some aspects to it that needed some kind of clarification. And that's why I always want to be on that constant state of improvement, you know, as uh, Bruce Lee said, we need to flow like water, right? So, uh, you know, if you keep, yeah. keep keep on flowing, keep on flowing. And even one of the classical scholars, uh, Imam Shafi, he was one of the, the, the early classical scholars of Islam. He was one of the founders of the Shafi school of jurisprudence. He mentioned something along the lines of, um, you know, be like a river, be like a flowing river, 
right? Because you know it never it never goes stale or you never get stagnant, and it, it gives life to things like plants and, and trees and stuff like that. I think he says something along those lines. So, yeah. So we need to keep on flowing like water, as Bruce Lee and Imam Shafi said. <laughs> well, well I, I'm familiar with Bruce Lee at least, and I, I, I can admit that yeah, he's he's a great guy to quote from. I mean, an inspiration <laughs> for for anyone you know who's familiar. Um, and and I think and I want to point out as well for viewers that aren't familiar with this channel already um and me i'm an agnostic atheist so i'm so basically how i kind of go about this is um i'm i'm not completely sure about the issue but based on what i have read based on what i have thought based on my just current conclusions um i don't believe um in a, a god a deity um but i'm open i'm very open considering you know, considering I, I don't know how, it's quite technical when we talk about, you know, what would convince us, I suppose, um, that's, that's kind of a rabbit hole. Um, maybe we could go into that later, like what would, you know, um, you know convince you, let's say, that, that, that God doesn't exist, uh, and me maybe, because it, it can be a, an interesting question, but I, I so I, yeah, I'm an agnostic atheist, um, I, I, don't, I don't believe in God, but at the same time, I also want to add a, add a caveat to what I said about the book, which is, you know, I, I love I love everything that I said about it. Um, that doesn't mean I agreed with all of mm. it. Um, if, if not uh, most of it, I guess by definition, I, I didn't agree with. But I think the thing that's important here <clears throat> is understanding how well a book is written. And when I was reading it, for example, I was like, OK, look, I'm, I'm not. Sometimes I was like, yeah, fair enough. I, I see where you're coming from. Um, and and other times you are like oh maybe I should I was thinking oh well actually yeah that's a good way to put it and, and maybe I need to rethink that and a lot of the times I was and that that doesn't happen that much when I'm reading that you know the books I've mentioned before I mean it, it does but the extent of which I was reading your book and I was like oh yeah yeah that's a really good way to way to explain it um that that happened to me on a frequent basis um so yeah I, I mean it's not like I, I thought, you know, it was all correct. Obviously not because, yeah, sure. you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not a Muslim at the moment. Um, but I think, and this is what I think not a lot of people understand, which is you can listen to an opposing view and you can still admit that it was argued well. You can still admit that there are things to learn that you didn't know about beforehand. So, and in that sense that, you know, that, that is kind of my, my my um my, my opinion on the book which is yeah it was just well written and even though i wasn't convinced i, I didn't jump ship i i, I still recognized that I, it, it was just it was just good enough that i was rethinking things um and in terms of i mean re revising the book further to be honest with you i yeah i mean maybe if i was to think more on muhammad maybe um more on um criticisms of muhammad as a character and i, I want to get into that a bit later um because you know that there are some popular sort of criticisms that are kind of like you know news headline quite quite uh, bland in in their proposition um so so yeah that there are there are things like that that i want to get into um starting off with a question which which is a pretty pretty basic one, but I I just wanted to understand your story a bit more. Um, I also want to just mention as well that I really enjoyed the the introduction to the book. Um, it was very personal. It, it just felt you know, a very comfortable way to start it for any you know agnostics, atheists, theists alike. Um, so I wanted to ask you, how did you come to the conclusion that Islam is the true religion and Christianity and Judaism are not? What to you makes Islam distinct? Mm, that's a very, very good question. So obviously my answers are not going to be the answers that I would that I would express 20 years ago at the time of my conversion. So even to make a claim that I'm going to give you the answer Hamza 20 years ago when he first converted is going to be totally very difficult to do because I'm a different human being now. Like we have many selves you know, many personalities, if you yeah. like, along the journey. Like my dad says, 
Bastin Bladisu, which means don't carry dead people on your shoulders. <laughs> the old self is a dead person. Yes, take responsibility in terms of what you did and who you were, and you, you may have to be held to account for sure, but don't carry that dead person on your shoulders. If you're a new person, then keep on developing. Yeah, There's a very powerful way of uh, putting it, yeah? and it sounds much better in Greek, I guess. So I'm going to answer it in, in terms of now, uh, what I be, how I believe um, Islam is distinct from Judaism and Christianity. Well, the first thing is... Hit, in essence, and what I mean by essence is the kind of the ultimate source of these traditions, there is no main difference, right? Because those traditions, according to the Islamic paradigm, the Islamic perspective, according to God himself, as stated in the Quran, that these traditions were once the truth. They were manifestations, expression of the truth. And what is the truth? In Islam, the truth is very, very simple. It's La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, the deity, God himself. And what does worship mean? It means to submit to God, to be humble before him, to have a positive fear. And what I mean by positive fear is not fearing an enemy or a monster, but rather you fear the loss of his pleasure, the loss of the, the, the relationship, the loss of the connection. You fear the consequences of moving away from the divine and it means to know god to love him to obey him as i as i just mentioned and to direct and single out all acts of worship to god alone the internal acts of worship like love our utmost love should be for the divine for god alone we must rely upon him and the and we must have gratitude utmost gratitude and we must extensively praise him these are aspects of internal acts of worship and the external acts of worship like prayer and giving charity and smiling and being good to people this should be done for his sake alone and obviously there is a connection between the internal and external acts of worship but it's healthy just to say that there is a distinction sometimes between the two so Worship from that perspective as well is to direct your internal and external acts of worship to the divine. Now, that was the message of all the prophets according to the Quranic and the Islamic paradigm, that all the prophets came with that message, la ilaha illallah, there is no deity worthy of worship except the deity, because the name Allah, according to some Arabic linguists, literally means al-ilah, the deity. And it's a very unique name, it encompasses all the beautiful names and attributes of God, and it's a genderless name, and it has no plural, which is very interesting. And this kind of alludes to the kind of transcendent nature of the divine, because from the Quranic perspective, we believe God is transcendent. There is nothing like God, there's nothing like his example. So... In reality, there was no original distinction, right? But the distinctions have happened over time because of what we believe to be human corruption. So take, for instance, the, the Islamic understanding of mainstream biblical Christianity today. The massive distinction is their conception of the divine. So the conception of the divine is the Trinity. So you have one essence, homoousios in Greek language is one essence, but there are three distinct persons and they are not like each other, but they are co-equal and co-eternal and they're all God. That itself is seen as shirk, shirk in the Islamic tradition, in the Quranic understanding is associationism, meaning associating partners with God, because Islam believes in the fact that God is uniquely one. In fact, in the 112th chapter, Allah says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Ahad means uniquely one. Allahu samad, that God is self subsisting, He is independent. And the chapter continues and says, He doesn't give birth, nor was He born, and there is nothing like Him. So, you know, the conception of God is fundamentally at odds with the Islamic understanding of monotheism. That's one key aspect. Another key aspect is the understanding of Jesus Himself. So Jesus himself, according to the Islamic paradigm, he was a prophet and he came to teach humanity exactly what I said earlier. La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship except the deity. But the kind of contemporary biblical mainstream understanding of Jesus is that he is not just a man. He's not just a prophet. In actual fact, the main 
creed and there are many creeds in the Christian tradition now you have many different um, understandings and sects but generally speaking the main, mainstream understanding is that Jesus is fully man and fully God and there's an interesting problem here especially from a kind of logical and theological perspective because the trinity is the son the father and the holy spirit and they're all god and they're all co-equal co-eternal and they're all different they have the different they different persons sharing a, that the same essence and the son came into the womb of mary according to the biblical understanding or interpretation of the biblical understanding and he came into into life into human form and he remained as fully god and fully man and then when he was you know so called resurrected he went up back up as fully god and fully man so the trinity now is the father the son and the holy spirit but the son now is fully god and fully man so what you see you see a, a change in the essence or in the conception of the divine prior to the incarnation you have the the jesus the son you have the father the son and the holy spirit co-equal co-eternal same essence and the distinct persons and then the son comes into the womb of mary comes into human flesh as jesus now as fully man fully god but prior to the incarnation he wasn't fully man and now the fully man fully god god man conception is now part of the trinity now that was one of and that's a particular understanding of mainstream christianity some christians may disagree many christian philosoph philosophers philosophers may disagree so i don't want to strong man the position but that's a kind of general view and for us that would be quite problematic because now there is a change in the essence of the divine and if you change the essence of something you've literally changed that thing so there's like two gods logically speaking so that's one problem in terms of the main distinction in islam is very simple and unique you can explain the theology the conception of god to a 7 year old you say god is one he is unlike anything you can imagine he created us he is the most merciful he created and owns everything he is the master the maintainer the shaper the fashioner the source of everything everything depends upon him he has beautiful names and attributes such as ar rahman the intensely merciful al wadud the loving al hakim the wise al alim the knowing and so on and so forth and he is worthy of our adoration of our love you know he is the source of love right he is the greatest benefactor you know naturally human beings love those who give them benefits even if it's a gift we even love benefactors even if those benefactors don't directly benefit us anyway if you hear a story about someone really amazing you have an affinity to them you have a natural inclination a love towards that person and god in our tradition is the greatest benefactor is albar he is the source of all goodness he is the 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 the, the greatest benefactor so he's worthy of our adoration he is and there's many reasons why he's worthy of our adoration of course as as one small uh, you know small reason and he's worthy of extensive praise extensive and and ultimate gratitude and the reason he's worthy of extensive praise and i mean we see this for ourselves i mean when i was looking at you sorry for even trying to create a similarity i hope you take this as a compliment you reminded me of david beckham right <laughs> a more a more a more handsome version of course yeah oh <laughs> so yeah so you know you know and you know david beckham was a, an amazing guy at free kicks right i don't know if you're like soccer or football but you know his free kicks were just phenomenal he had mastered the art of kicking a ball and placing it almost like laser like accuracy yeah? and you you and you are oh i remember when i was a kid and even a young adult and watching him i was like wow this is like phenomenal and many of the fans who supported england like you know i do when he used to play for england and take the free kicks and so on and so forth and he would do some amazing uh, amazing uh, shots or amazing goals or amazing free kicks and passes pinpoint accuracy laser like precision you're like how do you react you like your something is compelled within you to say bravo so give him a standing ovation or you know depending what your context is you go like wow that was wicked man or whatever you're going to say yeah you're going to praise him 
by virtue of his attributes. And in this case, his attributes are, you know, he's great at kicking a ball. Not only do we do this with football players, but we do this with, for example, if you like MMA, mixed martial arts. When you see Khabib, for example, he got McGregor to tap, right? And when you saw him being able to submit someone with ease and with such power and with such skill, you're like, wow, amazing. We do with poetry. If you like poets, for example, you know, Rumi is a poet that many, you know, English people and people of the West, I don't like using the term West in that categorical sense, but you get the point, you know, people of uh, the Western inclination and, and, and understanding and, you know, they've studied here, they're going to hear about Rumi because Rumi has become like a, 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 whole, a name, a dinner table name, right? So Rumi, for example, he talks about love and he says something along the lines of, you know, lovers don't really fall in love. They were already in love before they met, you know, which I think is really powerful because when you have children, or even when you have a partner, you realize if you love them, sometimes you're like, you've always been part of me, right? Or you, you fill the hole that, you know, required filling or whatever, you, you know, especially when kids were born, my kids were born, you're like, you know, it's as if you loved them before they were even born or like they've always been part of your life. You've always loved them. Anyway, so, you know, when you hear great poetry by Rumi or Iqbal even, the poet of the East, when he said this one prostration that you find so difficult, which is the prostration in prayer, frees you from a thousand prostrations because in Islamic tradition, worshiping God, being at service to God, frees you from the shackles of all these other type of uh, pseudo, uh, you know, pseudo worship, if you like, because, you know, we'll talk about this later, but there is an argument that man is, in, is always in a state of worship, whether he's an atheist or whether he's a believer. And we could unpack that later. But the point is, you know, you'd be like, wow, that's a great line of poetry. Now, I've given you all of these examples because something we're compelled within ourselves to give due praise to things that have certain qualities and attributes, even though those attributes do not directly benefit us in any way. They don't sustain us. They don't keep us alive, for example. So the argument here is the reason that God is worthy of extensive praise is because, well, who is God? Now, in the Islamic tradition, God is maximally perfect. So he has names and attributes to the highest degree possible. For example, he is al-wadud. He is the loving. His loving is the most maximal and it's the purest form of love. Even if you, you know, you can't even compare it to any type of love in the Islamic tradition, because we would argue that even a mother's love, which is generally speaking, the greatest love in a worldly sense, although that doesn't mean all mothers are great for sure, but many are. And there are many better mothers than fathers, that's for sure, yeah? So, you know, a mother, she's sacrificial and unconditional love, but she needs to love. It completes her. But God doesn't need anything because he is al-ghani. He is the free, independent. He's al-samad. He is the self-subsisting. Everything depends on him, yet he loves. And he loves maximally. So we're thinking, wow, what kind of pure love that is. So when you think about God's names and attributes, the, the maximally perfect to the highest degree possible, so if we are compelled to praise things whose attributes are limited, contingent, and not perfect, because in Islamic tradition, we believe God's names and attributes have no deficiency, have no flaw, they're perfect, then what does it mean about praising God? And that's why God deserves extensive praise. And extensive praise, praise itself, is a form of worship in the Islamic tradition, because in the first chapter of the Quran, which is called Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening, God says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all perfect praise and gratitude belong to the Lord of everything that exists. So praise and gratitude are very closely connected to our understanding of how we should relate to the divine. And in this case, you know, these, these are acts of worship, they're internal acts of worship, for sure. And they could be external by virtue of expressing that praise. So they're connected. But the thing is, extensively praising God, we believe is a rational thing to do, because if we're compelled to, to praise imperfect things with you know and they're limited and contingent they don't directly benefit us benef benefit us in any way then what does it mean about praising god himself and that's why sometimes when we think about a great scientist you know a muslim would praise the scientist say he's an amazing scientist scientist whoever he is he's done great work you know we we we, we give praise in terms of you know credit where it's due right but for the muslim they have a different metaphysical lens they're thinking but God deserves extensive praise and gratitude because who enabled that person to be in that way? 
you know, we could praise the great mind of a scientist. What about the one who created that mind? We could be, you know, in awe with regards to natural phenomena, but what about the one who put that in place? We could be, you know, in awe about, you know, we were talking about animals and, and veganism a little bit just before we came, uh, we started recording. You know, some animals, you know, God tells us to, to, to observe animals and they live in communities just like you. And God gives us these signs so we could learn about ourselves. For example, penguins are greater fathers than me. He's a greater father than me. I, I, I don't think I could ever hold an egg for six months on my legs in the freezing cold. I mean, I could try and do it, but do I have the ability? Do I have the patience? I don't know. And when you see a penguin doing that, you're like, hats off, man, right? You learn a lot from animals, right? But who created that compassion in that animal? Who created that animal in the first place? Who created the asbab, as we say in Arabic, the physical causes in the universe to enable these things to happen? You know, there is a, there is a greater reality that deserves extensive praise and ultimate gratitude. Now, what, now just to end this, why ultimate gratitude? Because if you think about the most basic things that we take for granted that are extremely priceless, if we focus on them and reflect on them properly, then it should invoke some kind of immense gratitude, even if you don't believe in the divine. For example, James, let me ask you a question. If I said to you, you had, okay, let's do it this way. Let's just, just do a few things. Imagine I give you 10 million pounds right now, no strings attached. How would you react? Be honest, be honest. <laughs> no strings attached. It's yours. You could do whatever you want with it. And if you lose that 10 million, I'll give you another 10 million. No strings attached. I mean, literally, imagine I just did right. that. What would you do? Um, be in shock, perhaps faint. But I would be, but I, but I would be, you know, after that initial psychological reaction, I would be like, kind of like, oh, well, this person just, you know, just, just did this for me. And it would be, it would be unreal in the sense of, like you say, gratitude. It would be, it would be this immense sense of um, thankfulness or whatever way you want to put it. Yeah. Would you be, would you be overjoyed, happy? Yes. Well, immensely. Yeah. Okay, good. Sure. Now let's just slightly change the thought experiment. Sure. Imagine I gave you 10 million pounds, no strings attached, but because of some kind of metaphysical cause and effect for you to have that 10 million pounds tomorrow morning, you cannot wake up. Would you take the ten million pounds? So what? I, I I can't wake up. You You're say. dead, basically. Right. You die in the morning. Well, well, yeah. I mean, I obviously it wouldn't it would be a good deal, would it? Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be there to use it. I, well, unless I would, unless I, I unless I suppose. I mean, I guess you could wriggle out of it and say, "Oh, I'll just give it to my family." But obviously, immediately it would be like, "Well, no," because I it, it, it loses so, its immediate value of course so from that perspective therefore we should be waking up with the joy of having receiving more than 10 million pounds right because we've just done a juxtaposition we said well if i give you 10 million pounds you'd be overjoyed great but if i give you 10 million pounds and tomorrow morning you're gonna die you can't wake up would you take it no so you're the very fact that you can wake up and be alive mm. is far more valuable than 10 million pounds so life itself is extremely extremely priceless and we don't own it we can't even create a fly we don't necessarily deserve it and from that perspective when a muslim talks about gratitude we're not just saying be grateful for your wife your car your kids your health we're saying the very fact that you're alive you're given a free priceless gift, which is every conscious moment that you don't necessarily deserve own, right? You don't own or, or deserve. And, and you've done nothing to, to, to receive such a priceless gift. So if that's the case, then surely we should be in a state of gratitude. Now, this, goes, this is a universal concept. You don't even have to believe in God at this stage. But at least we open the space or we open the door to enter the space of you know what i need to start thinking a little bit more deeply about what i should be grateful for because we take these things for granted and these type of thought experiments help us to be in that deep state of gratitude so obviously for the muslims we're like well god created us he is al khaliq he is the creator he is al khalaq he is the perpetually creating and therefore he created my life in every conscious moment so i have to be ultimately grateful to him why 
because I receive a free gift that is priceless at every moment of my existence, uh, at every moment of my, of my existence that I don't necessarily earn, own, or deserve. So that's why we should be ultimately grateful to the divine. Another similar thought experiment, I've mentioned this in the book, is about the heartbeat. You know, if you had, if I said to you, you got 10 heartbeats left, but in order to have another 10,000 heartbeats, you have to give me all of your wealth. I mean, most people, and I've done this many times with people say, yeah, I'll give you all of my wealth. So I say to them, well, this is interesting because God says in the Quran, you cannot enumerate his blessings, meaning you can't count individually his blessings. And the heartbeat is only one blessing. It's like the physical, biological cause that keeps you li alive, the heartbeat. Now, can we enumerate individually all the heartbeat lifetime? Well, it's actually practically impossible. For the first two or three years, you don't have, you have a backlog, right? <laughs> because you don't know how to count. When you're sleeping, you're definitely not counting. Yeah. When you're eating, it's a bit difficult. So the point is, you will never be able to enumerate every single heartbeat. Now, change it slightly. Say thank you every time you have a heartbeat or every time you've had a heartbeat. It's too much. It's, it's going to be a lifetime of thank yous, right? And it'll be perpetual almost. So from that perspective, you will never be able to be truly grateful. And yes, Lots of suffering happens in the world. Lots of bad things happen in the world, for sure. And there's, there's other ways of dealing with that because for blessings, you deal with them in, with gratitude. And in the Islamic tradition, with calamities or tests, you deal with it with patience. And you deal with it, with, you deal with it in a way that God wants you to deal with it because he wants you to give the meaning that he's given this calamity, not the meaning you've given the calamity, which we believe helps us transcend these obstacles in life. But yeah, life is full of pain, for sure. But I just wanted to make the point here that this is why ultimate gratitude belongs to God. And this is the most basic. This, well, no, I'm, I'm not even talking about the very fact that we can speak to each other through a computer. Or the very fact that we have a stream of consciousness or we, uh, we have the ability to have rational insights or we have the ability to love. I'm saying the potential to exist, right? Mm. We don't earn, own or deserve and it's freely given to us and we know it's priceless just by virtue of these thought experiments. So when we say God is worthy of worship, Essentially, because praise, extensive praise and gratitude are keys to other, to other types of worship. So we say, yeah, God is uh, worthy of worship. So the dis sorry for the long answer. You have to learn to <laughs> interrupt me. Yeah? Just to summarize, the, the main distinction is in the theology with the Christian tradition, the Trinity and the understanding of Jesus, right. and, and also the conception of monotheism. And the most important thing that for, for the Muslim is kind of perennial truth which is la ilaha illallah there is no deity or object of worship worthy of worship except the the deity allah and you know that includes being submissive and humble and loving god and trying to know him and recognize him and directing the internal and external acts of worship to god alone so that's right. the main kind of distinction between islam and Christianity. And yes, there is also a distinction with the Jewish tradition, but maybe we could unpack that a bit later. I've, I think I've overkilled this answer, to be honest. No, well, you know, I, I think I think you gave it a thorough answer, which is what I've been used to in your book. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate that. Um, the, the gratitude point, I think, was important for you to make because it's, I, I feel it's something that isn't really brought up that much. Um, it, it's kind of, because it isn't a philosophical argument, right? Because it isn't something that would you know, the, the atheist necessarily would be swayed by it in any sense, but but it's very basic in the sense that it, it is, as you say, <clears throat> vital to 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 Islam. Um, and 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 so I think it's you know worthy of you mentioning it. I mean, me as a me as an atheist, I find my gratitude in uh, I, I mean, I don't know if I could say I like reading Holocaust literature or, or war literature, but 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 I read it almost as if I feel like there's a duty to. Because, um, you know, if we don't, what that saying goes, if we don't understand the past, then it will happen again um, in, the, in the present or in the future. But, but the way that I find my gratitude is, well, one of them is, is reading that kind of literature and realizing, look, think of World War II, think of, think of the Soviet Union, right? And there's, uh, I, I can't remember what the, the book was, maybe it was, the librarian or the, the tattooist of Auschwitz maybe um but but Lael I can't remember his second name Seklov or something like that um he had a quote which was if I wake up today is a good day 
And it, what you said really, really reminded me of that. Like you were kind of talking about that concept of like, you know, waking up and having this. And I think this is a really important thing, actually. And, and it's, it's not by any means easy, um, but like to wake up every day and, and to have. And I guess it can be um, acquired through prayer, maybe, or, or meditation. But to realize that, look, regardless of your economical stamp, uh, your, your position or you know or, or, or what job you might have like it, it's it to me and i think we'd agree here it's it's a basic thing mm. at least to realize that hey look you, you you're not you're not um in this position that people were in two thousand years ago uh you know in a, in a war that literally wiped out and, and your your town isn't being savaged by vikings or something like that look at least something is going right today like because you know and I, th- I feel it's all about putting things into perspective, you know, but because you can, you can drop your favorite glass, right. But then you realize, Hey, look, it's my favorite glass, but I think they do others. You know, I think you can buy more. And so it isn't something what, what you're losing isn't, it, it isn't lost forever. Right. Um, and, and maybe we can go into, I mean, <laughs> there's so many avenues of thought here, um, but maybe we could go into like materialism and, 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 um, and, and how that affects sort of the, 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 the modern life, as it were, like how people are losing their reli- religiosity, which I think, uh, I'm, I might get a lot of hate for this, but it's like, as you know, as, as, as an atheist, of course, it's like, well, you know, I, I do think religion is useful. I do think that, um, you know, it, it, Hitchens is, I mean, <laughs> does reli- no, religion poisons everything? It's like, I mean, no, no wonder, I mean, he's a journalist. No wonder he had that title, you know, as much as I admit all day long to enjoying Hitchens and his, his humor, his rhetoric, um, I realized that in a lot of ways, it was actually quite surface level. Um, and, the, you know, the same with Dawkins. I love his Selfish Gene. I absolutely love that book. I think his science work is, is great. He's got delusion. <laughs> That, I mean, I think there's a, I don't know what, which atheist philosopher said it. I, I really can't remember, but, but it was like, I, I wouldn't give that to like undergrads or something to, to read because it's just that offensive. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, go ahead. Professor, Professor Michael Rules, who's an atheist, who's a philosopher of science. He, he I think I, I mentioned it in my book. He said something along the lines of, you know, he was ashamed of of the kind of <laughs> new atheists i think right. new atheism is dead now anyway there's a lot of young people like yourselves and others who are far more nuanced they don't want to straw man a particular tradition they want to have a further understanding they want to have a conversation i truly believe new atheism is, is completely i think it's 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 dead generally speaking you know it, yeah. it might exist here and there but now it's it's people want to have a conversation now and, and people want to understand each other it's not just about ideological rhetoric and it's about listening with the intention to understand and i think that's that's so important and even we teach muslims this and when we teach muslims to share and defend islam intellectually in our courses one of the things we teach is you know make a distinction between the drama and the reality right and there is a difference between the drama and the reality the reality is what is and the drama is the lenses that you put on your eyes to understand what is. And those lenses have been formed by your limited ideas, limited experiences, your own ego, and so on and so forth. You know, that need to always be right and never be wrong, that need to always impose and never to be imposed upon, and that need to always look good and never look bad to the degree that you give up the right way of doing things. So listening with intention to understand is very difficult because we always have that internal radio. We have to Mm. try and turn it off. Dispositions and and things like that. Yeah, Yeah. so... And we have to like be a kind of blank canvas and understand the person for who the person is. And in today's narcissistic society, that is extremely difficult because you're always, you're always playing a projection of yourself in your mind. Like, you know, when you're talking to people, you project yourself. How? In some cases, you project yourself by projecting your understanding, your ideas, your history, your perspective. And all you end up doing is relating with yourself or relating with something that is not who that person is. And it's very difficult. So imagine, you know, you come to a student table at university and I'm trying to promote Islam. 
and you introduce yourself as James, I'm the agnostic atheist. Now, if I have a limited understanding of what that means, I'm be like, oh yeah, I read a book about atheists and they just love science. And uh, the book I read as well was, was Dawkins and he's very arrogant. So this person loves science and he's very arrogant, right? And therefore the way you're relating with that person now is gonna be as if you're relating to a person who just loves science and is very arrogant. But you would, you, you would have totally missed out the fact that James, yeah, he loves science, but he wants to talk about values. He wants to talk about philosophy. Yeah, Dawkins may be arrogant. That may be your position. But James, he's a good kid. He's just asking some sincere questions. You, you miss that out in the discourse because you've projected yourself or your limited, your drama or your limited experience understanding. And that's why it's so important, you know, the likes of Hitchens and others teach us in, in a way. They teach us how not to be. And I, I was like that for a while, for sure. But I think it's very important just to be, yes, assertive with your views and your values, but also stand in the possibility that the person you're engaging with, you could learn a lot about yourself and about them and about the ideas that you're articulating. And if you're, if you're committed to their well-being, from the Islamic perspective, it means loving for others what you love for yourself. You want goodness for them and guidance for them then you have to listen with the intention to understand because who are you dealing with? You're dealing with another, the other. And unfortunately in today's secular neoliberal society, it's, you know, everyone has to be, it's like this monolith and everyone's the same and we don't know how to love anymore. And there's a really good book by the Korean born German scholar, uh, Byung Chul Han, I think his name is, it's called The Agony of Eros. And he's, make, he's made a phenomenal point about love itself. He says, in our narcissistic society, we don't know how to love anymore because we don't appreciate the other. There is someone distinct from us. So because we're narcissists collectively, right? We project ourselves on the other and we end up loving ourselves and not loving the other person. And that's why, you know, even if you read the, the, the five love languages, you know, everyone has their own love languages, right? I mean, for me, it's like touch and acts of service and quality time. If you give me gifts, I'm not going to, my love tank is not going to be filled. It's not going to be full, but for someone else, it might be gifts and words of affirmation. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm giving them, if I'm loving them the way I want to be loved, they're not going to feel loved at all. So the art of love is really to love the person the way they want to be loved, not the right. way you want to be loved. And that is right. so difficult. And that requires you to appreciate that an other exists. But because we live sometimes, you know, I know it's, it might be a bit of a collective straw man, but generally speaking, we have this kind of collective narcissism. We project ourselves on the, the object of love and we end up loving ourselves and not loving the person. And he's made a phenomenal point. I don't know how I got to this. How did I get here? Anyway, I'm going to go on these tangents. You have to bring me in. Bro. You have to bring me in. You <laughs> well, uh, me well, they all, they all well, come together. They, they all come yeah. together in some sense. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there's there's so much more. I mean, I, I feel like this is one of those discussions where a lot of things are just going to be flown about, and we're going to get back to certain oh. points. Um, yeah, I I mean, there is one question, but I also, but I I did want to mention the the debate you had with Lawrence Krauss, um, and how, yeah, and and just I, I I've I've seen that so many times, and was that. It was definitely one of the first times I, I, I consciously, like consciously watched a debate and I was like, Kraus, like, what are you doing? Like, he, he was just being extremely rude, dismissive. You were laying out lines of argument, premises, and he would get up and just do a Hitchens, like, you know, appeal to emotion, like, this is nonsense. It's like, I, I saw your face. I was, I was actually rewatching it today because it's just, <laughs> it, I, I really enjoy it. But it's also it's such a great thing to look at and be like, yeah, this is clearly when the atheist didn't look that good. It's like, I saw your face when he was like, like, you, you sat down after doing your great job of, you know, presenting your arguments, which look, regardless of whether I agree with them or not, mm -hmm. you presented them very, very well and, and philosophically, professionally. He just gets up on, on the podium and he just calls it nonsense. And I saw your face and, and, and I think that was the face of like definitely more than half the viewers. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Cause you've got a lot, a lot of closed minded, uh, I guess, yeah. viewers, but, but I saw your face. It was just face of like, why did I come here to discuss this topic? And this guy 
isn't bothering to go through like the, the different premises that I just made, the, the different um, you know syllogisms and so forth. Why am I here? And 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 I don't I don't I mean look okay I just want to make it something clear like I'm being very very um uh I, I'm kind of hating on atheists at the moment and I'm and I'm sorry to anyone who's listening who who is an atheist as well I, I don't mean to it's more the new atheists I, I want I want to specify that the I have a good story the new though. atheists have, that is my have, that's where my problem is I have a good story with regards to this so. I did get a lot of positive feedback from atheists. They almost disassociated themselves from Krauss. But I think Krauss felt the need to do that because the new atheist movement narrative was we shouldn't give them intellectual space. You know, uh, religious people are like flat earthers. You don't even give them any space. But I think the very fact that we were able to engage in a debate intellectually, whether or not one agrees with the arguments or not, the very fact that you're on the platform the religious person has always has already won with the new atheist because their narrative is you guys are like flat earthers. And the minute you can start challenging them on epistemology and certain issues that he didn't even really understand. And don't get me wrong, if I were to do that debate again, I would change a lot of things. In actual fact, it would be great. Maybe we could do another podcast after this in the future and we just analyze the debate and I critique myself and you critique me. That would be a good one, actually. Oh, yeah, no, that, five, that sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would love yeah. to do that. I've always wanted to do that, but I just need someone to push me to do it. And you doing it, I feel compelled and out of duty to join you and just like yeah. cuss out Hamza eight, nine years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, see, not all people are the same. Like Allah says in the Quran, God says, God says that in chapter three, I think verse 113, people are not the same. So, yeah, you may have categories of people like, the polytheists, those who are ungrateful, those who reject the truth in the Quranic paradigm. But those are primarily there for you to see if you're one of those people individually and for you to be able to make distinctions between those because making distinctions empowers you in many ways, intellectually, existentially, philosophically, emotionally, spiritually, you have to be able to make distinctions because if you don't know, you know what is ingratitude, then how do you know how to be grateful and stuff like that. But God, clarifies and says people are not the same and you see from the behavior people are not the same like i give an example i had a debate with professor ken james he's a nietzsche scholar one of the greatest scholars on nietzsche he was the dean i think he was the dean of philosophy at burbick university university of london and i had a debate with him in queen mary university and i was like you know deductive argument and proofs and stuff like that and he was responding and we had a really good discussion and an interesting story is Muhammad Hijab was a student in the audience at that time. Oh, and I didn't Hijab. Know I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't yeah. know him then. And he, yeah. he stood up and he, I think he was trying to challenge Ken James on Nietzsche. And I was like, excuse me, sir, this guy's a scholar of Nietzsche. You know, you're just doing your BA, whatever you're doing. You know, I was, I was, I was, I was nice to him as well. I was like, you know, I was trying to give uh, due respect to the professor. Anyway, so uh, that was my first interaction with the, the giant Hijab. Yeah, yeah. MashaAllah. So yeah. what happened was is uh, after the debate, we had a bit of a discussion. And I think from what I remember, Ken Jean said, look, you know, I'm not a new, new atheist. I don't really like that narrative. I'm about values because he's a Nietzsche scholar. And he said, look, my main issue is, you know, why am I, why have I taken care of my 18 year old disabled son for 18 years? You know, and I was like, you know, I didn't at that time, you know, immature, didn't know how to respond properly. But the way he came to me was I sensed, a lot of genuine genuineness from him, right? To cut a long story short, after a few years, I wanted to get into academia. So I had to start with a postgraduate certificate in philosophy. So they wouldn't let me in unless it was at the discretion of Professor Ken James, because he was the Dean of philosophy. Right. Because he remembers how we interacted relatively positively at the debate. I didn't burn my bridges, so to speak. He lets me in. I do the postgraduate certificate of philosophy, then I do the MA, then I do the MRes, and now I'm a PhD student. But the thing is, when I finished the MA, I think it was the MA, I emailed him saying, I just want to really thank you because, you know, you're one of the causes, uh, you know, in the Islamic tradition, being grateful to God, a sign of gratitude to God is that you thank other people because they're the causes that God put in your life, right? And if you're ungrateful to people, it's like being ungrateful to God. So I reached out to him. You know what he said? He said, let's have lunch. I want to tell me your story. I'm like, whoa, man. You know what I said earlier? 
you know, one of my trigger points is uh, being misunderstood. Yeah. But if you want to, if you want to understand me, then that's it. I've fallen in love with you. <laughs> so he's like, tell right. me your story. Let's have lunch. I'm like, wow. Yeah. So we have lunch. And what does he do? He, we order food. And then he says, no, we share from the same plate. He cut it in half. Honestly, I feel like crying. It was like, wow. I was like, whoa. And we had a genuine yeah. discussion about Nietzsche, about morals, about why God is worthy of worship. Like I was able to express Islam, not in the, like I put a hat on saying I'm going to teach you something, but it was natural, organic through the conversation. So he understood what the Islamic paradigm is. It's about affirming God's oneness and submitting to God and just following all the prophets, the Abrahamic tradition, right? The Abrahamic way, which is to submit to God, to love God, to obey God, to direct your acts of worship to God, to praise him, to be grateful to him, to be good, be at service to human beings, stuff like that, you know. And uh, we had a really good discussion. And at the end, when I walked him back to his, I think, to his office, he gave me a hug. So I like to say to these stories because it teaches not only Muslims, but all human beings that everyone's different. And mm. the sunnah, sunnah means the way of the prophet. The prophetic way of dealing with individuals is to individualize them. Right. And that's why you see in his history, in his narratives and authentic traditions, in certain contexts, maybe depending on age and experience of the person or background, there was a different relation, way of being with that person. Because we believe the prophet upon whom he peace was in the most optimal way of being for that particular person in that particular context. Mm -hmm. And that's why sometimes you can't use that as a universal. You have to really unpack what was going on there. So you have to individualize. And once we individualize the person, the other, as Byung Chan, Chan Chun, I forgot his name now, but the Korean-born the Korean -born, Korean -born professor that I spoke about, if you appreciate that there is an other with their own individuality and history and perspectives, and you know you're not going to just project yourself or your ideas on them, and you, you're going to relate to them in a far more different way. And you're going to engage yeah. with them in a far more different way, in, in a way that's empowering. And that's what we need to do, especially in the online world. Look, to be honest, do you know how many people ask me sometimes for discussions? And I, I, sometimes I get a lot, right? Well, relatively speaking to, to, to other, in, in contrast to other people. Mm -hmm. um, I said yes to you because of how your way of being. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. It wasn't framed as a debate. It wasn't framed as I'm right, you're wrong. It wasn't framed as I'm here to annihilate you. It wasn't framed like that. It was framed as a conversation. Right. And it was, and just the way you interact with me and you spoke to me, I'm like, this is a decent human being. Let's have a conversation, right? Because usually in the online world, so much ego, right? So much, uh, we live in an ideological, ideologically hot world where everyone already has their frame of reference, their meta narratives, their ideological arguments, and it's like a battle. That's the that's the that's the kind of default way of being. But I sense a different way of being from you, and that's exactly why uh, I actually feel comfortable enough just to rant on and on in, in on your podcast. Well, I I, yeah. I I'm very yeah. I mean, I, I'm surprised. I mean, it was it took up a lot of courage actually to to message you because. Um, I, I I mean I basically said this indirectly, but um my favorite Muslim representative is you. I, I hijab is hijab is really cool. Um, but I must say his his way of debating isn't really my preference. Um and I was kind of put off by him. But you know what actually made me more sympathetic to um hijab was when he talked to Jordan Peterson, he it, it almost felt like he Maybe he was on his <laughs> best behavior, but he felt that, you know, you know, when you were talking about like the, the individual um, kind of thing. And, and I totally agree because it kind of works in, in any situation. Like if you talk to a bunch of guys, let's say, you know, uh, teenage guys and, you know, they might be aggressive to you as a as a guy themselves outside of their circle. But actually, when you talk to them one to one, I've always found that most of the time they're just really cool. And like they, they don't yeah, give so you that. Funny kind of aggression because they're in that that group and with hijab it almost felt and i've seen and i've seen you talk to uh, hijab as well um just some of your conversations and it i do feel like their hijab has this um debating persona and his true kind of compassionate side and his softer side comes out in those one-to-ones um especially with peterson it felt very genuine um 
that that was just a really cool one in itself but but your conversation yeah with hijab him... is hijab actually is a very very unique unique character like i've seen him on different levels in different scenarios and obviously when it comes to debating and you know if he debates someone who has been aggressive to islam he's a very passionate assertive confident strong human mm. being and he's going to come across that way but when it's someone who's neutral having a conversation i have seen hijab extremely humble compassionate kind and uh, yeah it's easy to misunderstand someone like hijab you know he's six foot six he's 120 kilos or something right he you know he's or he ticks all the box in terms of you know if you wanted someone on your side <laughs> you would want someone like <laughs> right him. he's got the physical attributes the intellectual attributes and you know re remember he's still relatively young and in terms of how much he's achieved so he's only 30 years old right and he's a father and i just see his project his his and he's a phd student now so his 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 trajectory he's only going to keep on improving and yeah he can be read that way but i think again you know i think we mentioned this earlier before we started recording when we see people's way of being or their statements we have to understand who said it why they said yeah. it, what was the context yeah. and usually with hijab the context is he he says look i have a moral justification because this person has known to hate muslims want to be violent against muslim or there's been indirect aggression against muslims so for example his david wood debate the way he came right. across he felt this is actually justified this person is what he would class as an enemy and we just have to basically do our best to show that because you know he he could be he could have been responsible and he has been responsible for a lot of islamophobia um and, and, and I'm not talking about Islamophobia in terms of, oh, you know, any type of intellectual criticism of Islamophobia. Sure. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that's a very weak position. I mean, like genuinely misrepresenting and, and, and showing that Muslims are the, like the fifth column or the boogeyman. So hijab has a context in terms of his way of being. And sometimes when you're like that a lot, it translates in other stuff as well. So it's just part of, you know, having good people around you and just developing. But yeah, hijab, uh, I've seen him extremely you should have him on, on, on one day i think he, he'll oh, love it. he's very compassionate and yeah. humble. Uh, well I, he's uh yeah he's uh, he's he's doing a lot now actually i'm i'm really surprised that you're not talking to um you know peterson and uh and cosmic skeptic actually i, I was going to say this for the end but i, I was going to ask you Amzil, <laughs> when are you going to get to these like you know when are you going to get on these debates again because you know, it, it's it, it would be great. I mean, obviously, no no pressure I mean, or anything, debate. but like I would I mean, love to see you talk to, you know, to, to Cosmic Skeptic and to um, old Matt yeah, Delahunty I, especially. I don't know uh, how familiar you are with Matt Delahunty. I but, am. But yeah. I, would, I mean, I would love to. Like the that. thing is though that debates in the Islamic tradition should be used wisely. Like if you're right. always debating, it can harden the heart. You know, because we have this idea of the spiritual heart. If you're always debating, it's not really good for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also, it's not the primary way of actually articulating Islam. So God says, call to the way of God, invite to the way to the Sabil, the path of God, with, with, with beautiful preaching, with hikmah, with wisdom, right? And then he makes a distinction and says, and discuss with them or debate with them in ways that are best. So with no harshness, you know, the ways that are best. Uh, grammatically, that distinction indicates that the primary form of conveying the message of Islam to people is with wisdom and good preaching and being good and excellent and good conduct. The debating strategy is an instrument. You have to use it wisely because if you're always debating, imagine we lived in a society that everyone just debated. And remember, the frame of the debate is, the way we frame debates usually in our current society is, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. And you have two opposing teams and very rarely do people say yeah i've lost that debate and you know there is a whole classical ethic on how to debate when to debate who to debate your way of being the ethics of debate and you know it has to be carefully done and unfortunately in today's society because we have social media everyone has a platform everyone is debating and i think there is a problem i would even argue that is contrary to the objectives of freedom of speech because historically the objectives of being able to express yourself is the objectives were truth, acquiring tr truth, you know, progress, taking power to account, uh, and so on and so forth. But sometimes if you're always debating in that ego context, in the context of I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm going to try and 
use sure. any type of rhetoric to, to, to win you over. Well, you're going against the actual objectives of freedom of speech, which is, well, I want to know what the truth is. I want mm. us to progress. The, the, and, and that's, that's why, why I kind of like uh, cross the, the cross examination section is what I mostly skip to when I watch debates, um, because if I feel like I don't know if you do this as well. I, I don't know if you, if you watch debates um, very frequently, if, if that's something you enjoy, because weirdly enough, I do. <laughs> but I, I, I like um, skipping to the cross examination section because I feel like you get a feel of their characters more and it's actually like a one-on-one -on -one conversation rather than like mm. on a on a podium i mean the cool thing about your your one with Kra uh, krausto is it i mean i must say the format was all over the place because of how volatile he was um and well i i guess i guess you both were in fairness because you were both riled up and you were both like you know it would it, it was just like that and i like that though because it felt more personal it felt it didn't feel boring and maybe at the expense of some regrets your way I don't know about Krauss but that was I, I found that very interesting just on an engagement level just because it was very passionate it just was it was very um personal almost felt because like you were implying before like Krauss there was something in him that felt the need to be so defensive um yeah I and and that was that was that's weird I, I guess um so I do, I do want to ask you because I, I I do have many many questions and, and uh yeah hopefully hopefully we can get through um uh, many of them um because we, you know we're 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 getting all excited which is great uh, but talking about many different things we'll just tie them all together as we have been doing um so I do want to ask you about the resurrection and because when I you know when I talk to Christians the the first thing they sort of say is the history is on the side of Christianity. Secular scholars, even like even secular scholars, um, concede that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And for me, I'm finding that very difficult to reconcile when it comes to uh, is Islam, because, you know, like I said before we were filming, I, I like I like philosophy and religion because I don't think it encapsulates merely its discipline it's politics, it's history, right? It's psychology. And I'm just wondering, is history on the side of Islam in, in the regard of the resurrection? I'm not really clear on this. Could you, could you offer some light here for me? Yeah, I mean, just as a caveat, this is not really my topic. So right. I'm gonna give you my kind of intellectual perspective of how sure. I've addressed all of these historical type of so-called historical frictions, if you like, yeah? So one would argue, or they, they may argue that if you look at history, there is a friction between a kind of under, historical understanding of some historians that whether we believe Jesus was a divine personality or religious personality, he died on the cross. And the Quran says he was not killed. He did not die on the cross. So there seems to be a friction with some historians. I don't find this a problem at all, because for me, it's just all about epistemology. Because when you study the philosophy of history, which many people don't, and that's one of the missing elements in the kind of Dr. William Craig arguments yeah. with regards to the historicity of, you know, some of the positions that he believes to be true, is, well, let's talk about the philosophy of history, just like what I do with the philosophy of science. Now, the philosophy of history is that you make inferences from historical data now those inferences are not absolutely true it's your best guess or it's your it's 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 a it could be a weak inference or strong inference the point is you can never claim i have the representation of the actual state of historical affairs you can't say that you can't say my conclusion here based on you know a few pieces of historical data my conclusion based on an inference is I can never say this is the complete representation of the historical state of affairs. You just can't say that. Just like in the philosophy of science, even if you're a realist, yes, obviously you're going to say a well-confirmed successful theory that has a lot of, that has predictive power represents the actual state of affairs is truth. However, there is a caveat. And the caveat is it could still it could still not be it could still change they still even realists believe 
it's not complete. It's, you cannot say that a well-confirmed theory with pre predictive power is, and a successful theory is, is, is absolutely true in that sense. Yeah. Obviously, because, you know, they're smart. They, they could never make such a claim. And we know that from history because historically successful theories that had predictive power ended up being false, right? So history against them from that perspective is also a very, a very simple logical argument to understand. The same thing applies to the philosophy of history. So for you, for, for me, just outweighing um, the evidences from an epistemic point of view. So you have few pieces of data. You have some historians making this inference. And you could say it's a level five out of 10 or six out of 10 epistemically concerning your conclusion relating to history. I would say based on other factors and based on an accumulative case, based on why I believe the Quran to be true and so on and so forth. And obviously that's another big long discussion. For me, the epistemic weight of Quranic conclusions are gonna be 10 out of 10 because I believe it's come from the one who has the picture and we just have the pixel. Right. It's that simple. So with any historical reality, I'm going to do that epistemic way. So when you look at the, by the way, there are other arguments actually um, showing that the case that Jesus actually died is, and, and that, you know, that it's a strong case is actually, there's so many other arguments to show that it's not a strong case, but I don't want to use that now because that's not my field. Yeah, but I know mm -hmm. many Muslim apologists, many Muslim thinkers, there's a really good book called, I forgot the book now, Jesus, Man, Messenger, Messiah. You can download it from the One Reason the Org website. It's a very phenomenal book. I know the brother who wrote it, Abu Zakaria. In actual fact, I think I reviewed that book. Um, and oh. he, he, he actually deals with these, with these concepts very well. And on his blog, he deals with these concepts as well. So there are other arguments to challenge it, but I want to mm -hmm. give people a very basic point. It becomes a conceptual tool. So they could, uh, they could use that for other things in history that might uh, uh, you know, uh, be at odds with a Quranic perspective, for example. And it may be the case because we have a limited understanding of reality. We don't know the full historical picture. So for me, it's just that epistemic weighing. That's how I deal with it. You know, people can make claims about so many things. People can make claims that, you know, Jesus, the, the story of Jesus was actually pre, pre-biblical, right? Pre-Jesus. It was like, you could find a similar story of, you know, a virgin birth and stuff like that in, I think, ancient Egyptian uh, history, right? Obviously, we have a way of understanding that. But the thing is, people could claim that that is an evidence for maybe, you know, G, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 that, that the whole Christian story is based on a fiction. It's a borrowed fiction. Maybe they could make that claim. Uh, but that's irrelevant. The point I'm trying to say is people can make claims based on any types of data. How do they make those claims? What kind of inference is it? Is it a strong infl inference? And when you study the philosophy of history, you'll know that with these kind of things, you give it a six out of 10 at best or five out of 10. But if I've got a source of knowledge and the claims that are being made have, have, a, have a, an epistemic weight that's heavier. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's a 10 out of 10. Rationally, I'm just going to take what's more certain. Now, the question would raise is, well, how do you know it's a 10 out of 10? Of course, I agree that. That's a longer philosophical, theophilosophical discussion to have. But if I truly believe that book X has come from the divine, and by virtue of it come from the divine, the divine no, has the full historical picture, we just have the historical pixel, then any kind of inference that we make based on limited historical data, epistemically is going to be much, much um, lighter, weaker than the epistemic status of claims made by God himself. Now, obviously, the, the right question follows, which is, well, all right, you need to prove to me that this is actually a, a valid source of of, of knowledge showed to me why the Quran is from God. Fine, that's a valid question, but this is the way I would deal with it from from that perspective. Right. It, it's yeah. I mean, it seems yeah. I mean, this this isn't your area, as you say. So it seems to me that you that you're kind of relying, or you personally are in this scenario, are relying on on your other kind of um, uh, basis or the basis, your basis of of the Quran's validity and truth. Um, that is what you're kind of relying on instead of directly um, kind of countering the historical sort of you know claim. Um, 
uh, you know, you're, you're using sort of um, other other parts, you, the authority of the Quran basically to um, intuit that it's mistaken that actually, you know, Jesus didn't die. Um, but of course it isn't your area, but, but that, I think I, that's, that's what you're doing. It's like, kind of like, kind of taking a step yeah. back and being more critical of how we actually come to come to have knowledge about history itself. But yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm under the impression that, um, cause you know, like you say, William Lane Craig goes on about it. Um, and I haven't yet heard, uh, I, I haven't yet heard, to be honest with you, I, I think there should be far more, far more Muslim uh, versus Christian and, and, and even atheist debates out there. Cause there's just so much on Christianity. I mean, all, all of the Hitchens' debates that he did for his book were, were all either Jews or, um, or, yes. or, or Christians. And, and, and for me, when I was, this is, a, <laughs> I mean, we're sidetracking again, but my fault. Um, but, but when I'm looking at debates to watch about Islam, there's barely any. Um, there's, mm-hmm. there's, Hitchens did actually do one with T- Tariq Ramadan, I believe. Yes, Professor um, Tariq Ramadan. Yeah, and... But the, the thing is with that is I don't think he had the rhetoric or the or the philosophical background to really show Hitchens um, that you know he, his his blanket statements weren't enough. Um, yeah, he's not a debater. He's not yeah. a, an apologist. I mean, look, yeah. he's an academic. He was sure. at that time an academic from Oxford. So in fairness to him, it's not his style. It's not his. Yeah. Uh, and as they say, styles make fights. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're a boxing fan, or right. you know, if you have a particular style, you know, you know, imagine, imagine Anthony Joshua fighting Mike Tyson of the yeah. day. That those that style will be yeah. explosive. It will be a phenomenal yeah. fight. So even with intellectual styles, make fights. So you, I, I know it's a maybe a negative negative way of framing the whole thing, but it's actually true. Like the way you come across your eloquence, the way you can articulate yourself, your presence of mind, your logic. Uh, the way you make uh, conclusions is all very important in the art of discussing and debating people. And, you know, if, if you're a nuanced academic, you know, he does speak very well for sure, but he's, I don't think he's a debater. So mm. in fairness to that, but in, in, in just to respond to your point about the history stuff, yeah. even if I knew the full nuanced academic stuff saying the historicity of the claim, I would still use this approach. Right. Because remember, the friction is history with the Quran. Now, if I go into history to debate the historical point and actually show that actually your historical inference is weaker because there's other historical evidence you've missed out, what I'm doing though is I'm giving, giving, I'm giving the impression to the listener or to the one who wants to understand this properly that you know, the historical evidences are always going to be the thing that give you the final conclusion. And that's not the case, because even epistemologically, that's not the case. So it's important to take the step back and understand, well, ha- ha- what is the philosophy of history? How do we make inferences from limited historical data? It's never 100 percent conclusion. It's never 100 percent true. So what I want to do is I want to bring them back to, to show them, well, irrespective of the way you viewed history, I have I have a source of knowledge here that I can show in my own way that it's a representation of the actual state of affairs. It when it makes a claim about history, it's true because of X, Y, and Z, mm-hmm. and it has a higher epistemic value, higher epistemic weight. Um, so I would still use the same approach because I think it's more empowering and it gets people to understand the mind of. The Muslim or the mind of why someone's accepting this to be it's, true. It's a deeper. It's a deeper. To me, it feels like a deeper uh, avenue to, because there's one thing, like you kind of say, of looking at sort of evidence, historical evidence, and coming to a conclusion based on what what's being asserted. But then there's the next thing of like, well, how? What's the details behind that conclusion that you've just read? Um, yes. The, the 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 context basically, and context is just really difficult i mean when reading the quran i just found it very confusing um t- to be completely honest i was very confused um because um and, and uh, yeah i mean you can you can give me your thoughts on this if you want but when i was reading it, i was like okay well on this part believers should be in other words kind of respected and 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 um and kind of um uh, talk to and, and maybe try to um convert them in there's probably a better word to say that but basically 
get them on your side and then and then another part of it says that they are you know the the, the worst of the worst that they'll that burn in hell in certain specific ways that for me was really confusing because i was like i was like why why is it so mixed up and yeah short context and that's that's the key word here like what what is the context of when this was said and who was it said for at the time like what war was this near and historically speaking and so that's what i'm kind of trying to say to myself i'm trying to say look i'm not just going to pluck things out and say ha ah, aha it says you know uh, disbelievers will burn in hell and then first chapter says talk to them nicely and you know it's it's like i i want to try and avoid that because to me it feels mm-hmm. like it, it feels too easy to me too easy yes. and, and when you were yes. talking about context it kind of reminded me of reading the Quran and, 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 at the, and at the beginning I was, I was, I was not really impressed because I, I, I was just very confused. I didn't really, I don't know. I just didn't really understand what the format was. I mean, it was, yeah, maybe, maybe you could just give me your thoughts on, yeah, I mean, on that whole thing. The, the interesting thing about the Quran is it's not like a storybook that you have. Yes. Like the Bible, you know, the beginning and right. the end, right. Which could yeah. be similar to the Bible. If you like, yeah. In actual fact, you know, the full story is laid out in, in, in Surah Yusuf, chapter 12 of the Qur'an. You have a kind of full story. But generally speaking, the rest of the Qur'an is, is I, I call it multidimensional, like the Orientalist Arbery, A.J. Arbery, who translated the Qur'an, actually. He, he kind of argued that, you know, the Quran has no beginning and no end because it's come from the one who has no beginning and no end, right? <laughs> and it comes from the timeless. So the way you approach nice. the Quran, yeah. Yeah. the way you approach the Quran is in that way. And for me, the Quran requires study. The yes. Quran indicates this very strongly. The Quran says, do they not reflect upon the Quran or are there locks on their hearts? So you could mirror the meaning here. The more reflection you do, the more your heart becomes unlocked to receive God's guidance and mercy. You know, if we take lots of time to analyze poetry and analyze Shakespeare and analyze all of these ancient texts, then, you know, the same kind of justice should be given to the Quranic discourse, especially given the fact that, you know, over, you know, nearly 2 billion people believe in this book and it's had an immense impact on the world, you know, whether we like it or not, there, there has been an impact. And from that perspective, you know, we just give it, we have an epistemic duty, a duty of knowledge to give it the same kind of, you know, justice, if you like, like we give any other text at school, Shakespeare, or whatever the case may be. And I'm saying this from a kind of, you know, secular perspective, we should give it that kind of justice. And that requires allowing the Quran to speak for itself, which requires study. Mm. So the Quran makes it very clear that there are verses that are ambiguous and unambiguous, right? And the un- unambiguous verses are the foundation of the book. And the ambiguous verses, you know, those with the sickness in the heart, they want to try and have a, you know, a dodgy interpretation. And what that teaches us as well is that you should view the, the ambiguities in the Quran in light of the unambiguities. So and that's the, f- the first point. The second point is the Quran teaches us to understand the Quran with the Quran. So when the Quran says, for example, you know, don't take the disbelievers as your allies, right? As your intimate friends. Okay, whoa, what does that mean? You know, it's a bit weird because the Quran says that a a Muslim man can marry a non-Muslim woman, a Jew or Christian. Well, God doesn't expect for him to hate his wife or not to take him as an intimate friend because you know god says marriage is about love and mercy right and about tranquility so when you read for example in the 60th 60th chapter of the quran verse 8 god says god does not forbid you to be just and kind with those who have not fought you for your religion or exposed you from your homes okay so we've got a criteria here if james is not fighting me because i'm a muslim he's not fighting me he's not expelling me from my home I have to have a sense of bir, of, of goodness with him, of intimate kindness with him, yeah? So already now you've got this kind of intertextuality, right? Because remember, the Quran is not straight prose. If it was straight prose, then you could be like, you know what? Fine, I don't get it. It's, it's not for me. But it's not straight prose. It's like a unique form of rhyme prose, as Devin J. Stewart said 
it's a Quranic sajaa, meaning it's a Quranic form of rhyme prose. So that would already give you the sign of, right, this needs some kind of analysis and unpacking. So I truly believe if someone is sincere and allows the Quran to speak for itself, all of these connections will be made over time. Um, because, you know, this, this stuff requires sincerity. And if it requires sincerity, then it requires time. If it requires time, then obviously you have to be thoughtful about the whole process. And any type of question that comes up, you see that there is an answer. So, for example, when, when God talks about certain disbelievers and the way we should relate to them, especially in certain chapters, when you read the verses before and after and the theme of the chapter, you'd realize, okay, it was the disbeliever polytheist at the time of war, which is fair enough. There's a moral context here, no problem. Then you have, for example, you know, the way it describes uh, some Christians some some of the Jewish people, like you know, the way it describes the Ahl Kitab, the people of the book, the way it says talks about hellfire and what hellfire is really about. Because if you have a very crude, shallow understanding, you'd be like, oh my God, going to hell forever. What's going on here? How can a loving Lord send you to hell? But really the Quran in a way tries to flip the question and says, well, how can you choose hell over a loving Lord? Because the whole Quranic narrative is, you know, the Quran, very God specifically says he doesn't prefer disbelief for his servants or he doesn't prefer, he, does, he prefers belief for his servants. That's the meaning here. And the classical exegete said, well, God wants goodness for people. He wants people to go to paradise. Okay, great. So what, what happens then? Well, don't blame God, blame your own hands. Even God says, you know, you wronged yourself. And don't blame God. You wronged yourself. You, in essence, through yourself, you pushed God's mercy and guidance away. You made the decision to have the consequences of alienating yourself from divine mercy and guidance. Uh, can and I, can same, I uh, ask you a question of? Um, sorry, to cut, cut it, cut in there. But no, what no, if you? What if? And this is something that I've I've been meaning to have answered let's say well what if you're genuinely an open-minded uh, atheist I, I try i try and be as open-minded as i can i try and approach these things just for the truth like you know i provided the you know provided god is all loving benevolent um I, I i why would you not want to believe in that um so I, i'm open to it it's just, you know, it's just a matter of me being convinced. But my question is, okay, so, and I don't know if, if, if this is something you've, you've thought about um, or, you know, if, you, if you've looked into or you've written about, um, but what if you are just a genuine atheist who just isn't convinced? You've read the Quran, you've read, let's say, the Old Testament. Uh, you've read actually all of these different books and you've maybe even dedicated your life to it, which I would argue many have. I mean, Nietzsche, the reason why I think he, probably to me anyway, he's my favorite atheist because he actually took things seriously. And I will, and I respect him for that. Like he, like he was a philologist. He, he, he understood how to, you know, look at context uh, as far as I can tell anyway, from, from his profession anyway. But I just get the impression that he really tried to understand theism he tried to understand philosophy <laughs> unlike newer proponents and so i respect him because he really put in the effort and so my question is now of course people are more have more depth than they let themselves out to be in their writing fair enough but let's say this person was just genuinely looking for truth and he just genuinely wasn't convinced he just looked into these all his life he was open to god but it just it just wouldn't go it wouldn't just wouldn't go forward um now my impression from from i guess theism in general and, and the understanding of of god is that person would go to hell and they'd be punished for essentially <laughs> doing their best all their life to understand truth and just because they're not convinced they get sent to hell anyway am i wrong in that on that conclusion because it i i feel like that's what theism as a whole like you know monotheism teaches um like all, yes. all together yes could you help that. me I, with this because yes. because this is something that is as I, I just have been trying to 
find the answer to this? I had the same problem, I think, just before I became Muslim when I was talking, talking to someone about my parents. He said it was a similar problem. But this is the Islamic theological understanding based on the Quran itself, okay? Mm -hmm. So the question presumes that sincere people will be punished. I can guarantee you that a sincere person will not go to hell. Guaranteed. But obviously, there is a definition of what sincerity means in the Islamic paradigm. But the reason I've mentioned this as almost like a rhetorical ploy just to get your attention is to make you think, look, why are we presuming our end? If someone is sincere, they will receive God's mercy and guidance, right? Generally speaking. And we believe that those who reject the truth are eligible for this kind of self-inflicted torment, if you like, right? Although God sends people to hell, but it's because of their own wrongdoing, their own mm -hmm. hands, right? God didn't want them to go there, but they close the door to God's guidance and mercy. But there are traditions, there are different schools of creed that unpack this, and they say, look, based on the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace, there are like four categories of non-Muslims that die in a state of not being a Muslim and they end up in paradise, right? So it's a nuanced tradition. And some of those categories include someone who's too old to hear the message, someone in between the messengers and so on and so forth. Now, some of the scholars, like the main scholars, like Ibn Taymiyyah, the 14th century theologian, Al-Ghazali, the 11th century polymath and theologian, they come to a similar conclusion, although the way they get there is a little bit different. But the conclusion is, is that, you know, especially, and I mentioned this in the book, I think Al-Ghazali mentions about P, uh, uh, the Byzantines. Uh, if they basically, all they hear about are negative things about the Prophet Muhammad upon him peace, they have no other knowledge apart from, you know, Islamophobic tropes and things like that, right? Then they, you know, they haven't received any guidance. They haven't received you know, the truth of Islam, they haven't had the opportunity to understand it, you know, and then rejecting Islam, are they eligible for hell? The scholars don't say that. The scholars say that God is just and he's merciful and he's maximally just and merciful. His justice and mercy are to the highest degree possible without, without any deficiency and flaw. And therefore no one will be treated unjustly. So see it from a top-down perspective mm -hmm. because we don't know the specifics. This is about the human heart. You know, you know, I may claim to be a Muslim, but I may not die in that state. You know, may God protect me. But, you know, you may claim not to be a Muslim, but you may die as a Muslim. We don't know what's going to happen in the next 10, 15, 20 years or even 15 minutes, right? Right. So these are hypotheticals. What God wants you to understand is if you identify, if you are a person who does reject the truth, this is the spiritual consequence. If you identify yourself as sincere and you are accepting the truth, this is the spiritual consequence. If and, and so on and so forth. So from that perspective, I'm just going to say what the famous classical scholar said, Sufyan al Thawri. He said, "If I had to choose between my mother and God to, to judge me on the day of judgment, I would choose God, because the Islamic position was always that God is more merciful and more just than anyone and anything you can imagine." And this is, now the good sign is when you're reading the Quran, you're internalizing some of this, like, oh, oof, am I the one who's rejecting the truth here? If that's the case, whoa, this is like, you know, it, it wakes you up to other realities to start investi investigating and, 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 and um, pursuing a path of truth. But at the same time, you have to allow the Quran to speak for itself. And you will come to the conclusion that, God is more just and more merciful than anything and anyone I can imagine. And therefore, whatever happens to me, me or you, no one could have made a better decision. Given that's the case, and given that there are realities such as eternal bliss in paradise and eternal, you know, almost self-inflicted torment, given that those realities are possibly true for the skeptic, it should encourage them to take this more seriously and be on the path of, right, how am I... What, what is the truth in this? Is God worthy of, worthy of worship? Does God exist? You know, is this intuitive and part of my innate disposition? Let me think about that. You know, is it, you know, Muslims would argue belief in God is self-evidently true. We would also argue that human beings are always in a state of worship anyway. 
whether you believe in God or not. I, I agreed because... with you on, on, on that. I mean, um, I, I definitely do in this sense. And I think this is what you mean, because it was in your book. Um, but I, it provided it's what I remember. It's essentially that, you know, even if we're not praying to God, we're still, we're, we're still worshipping, you know, um, I don't know, an ideology, um, maybe somebody else for that matter, um, or, or basically material things. Like, mm. like I think you, you mentioned a few times in the book, um, and I definitely agree with that. I, I you know, I, I think, I, I think that people. Okay, so so I do. Um, I, I'm very interested in psychology as well. I, I'm uh, I'm on my sort of work year at the moment as an assistant psychologist, and I go back oh, to do my 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 third year um, in September. Um, and so I'm really interested in psychology, more abnormal psychology, like the stuff that hasn't been like uh, near death experiences. I love all that. That's interesting. Oh wow, wow. Yeah, I, I love all that. I I've I've um, when, when I was assigned a um, what is it a an assignment on that, I was really excited and investigating that was great. Um, but uh, oh, I, lo I lost I lost track now. Um, what, let's let's rewind. Where where was I going with this? Um, oh yeah, so on a psychological level, people need values, right? And and this is where Nietzsche is really cool as well, because he was talking about how important God is. And I completely agree with him in this sense. And look, regardless of whether he was being literal or metaphorical, the point remains, was he wrong? No, people need, and, and this is where I was, you know, talking about psychology. It's, you know, from my, from my studying psychology, I've, I've definitely realized that people need their own gods, whether it's substance, uh, substances, uh, material possessions, other people, um, people need something to idolize. Some people need a higher being to look towards because yes. without that, you know, <laughs> then there's nothing. I, I was talking to Sheldon Solomon, um, co-founder of Terra Management Theory. He's, he's, he's so cool. I'm, I, I love talking to him. He, he's, um, I don't know if you've read the, the Worm at the Core or The Denial of Death, um no. i don't know if you're into like death psychology not the most uplifting thing <laughs> but um <laughs> but but i was talking to him and he was and and this is actually linked to our mortality um which is and he you know he's talking under a secular perspective but he was kind of saying look in the past people have used uh cults um and he would you know put religion uh, as well and and rituals you know all these different kind of modes of being right and they'd use this to essentially ignore the fact of their mortality, ignore the fact that their time is finite. Um, and terror management theory is essentially that. It's, it's, it's the idea that um, whatever we do is essentially a response to our inevitable death and, and that everything we do is in avoidance um, or denial of it. Um, I would highly recommend The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker um, and The Worm at the Core by, by Solomon. They're, they're really good, um, very, very interesting pieces. Um, and I, th I think linking this, right, to what you said about worshipping, it's completely true. The psychology all, all backs this up. And, and obviously the philosophy in Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's thing, it's like it all adds up. We mm. all need something higher to strive towards because without it, well, we're, <laughs> we're just reminded. Well, I mean, at least Nietzsche in my position. Yeah. But go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Nietzsche was interesting because, you know, when he said God is dead, he didn't mean that in a kind of ontological sense. Right. He meant it like the God is dead in the hearts of European people. Yes. And they're going to realize that they don't have a basis for their values. Mm. And they have to now become gods themselves in a way. Yeah. Scary. Superman. Yeah. yeah. And so he realized you needed that anchor. But he also realized as well that if that's the case, then everyone's going to have a different set of values. And he kind of almost said, well, I have my values. Where are yours? And he also linked um values to power that might is right to a certain degree right um so he he he, he was very prophetic in a non-religious sense like he actually yeah. he actually for me and i'm not a Nietzschean scholar or anything but he prophesized what's happening in europe today yes right? i would say so to, yeah to a certain degree yeah. he 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 was even maybe one of the founders of postmodernism, which wants to tear down any type of hierarchy or meta-narrative or any truth and I think that's where the danger is in postmodernism to that degree, because for, in the postmodernist ideal is that it's all about the individual and the individual mm -hmm. defines himself, defines his truth, defines his identity and de defines anything that 
anything really and they are they become the god from that perspective because modernism was a little bit different it was more mankind is is is, is centerpiece now you know there is objectivity and you have you know the use of mathematics and these scientific tools to come to objectivity and there is mind independent things and you have these established you know hierarchies or you know values or ideas now that all changed in postmodernism instead of mankind being central they became the individual human themselves and and i would argue postmodernism you may disagree with this but postmodernism is like the the worship or the glorification of the self um of the individual of the ego um and there's a lot of dangers in that you know especially their view on language their view on all mm-hmm. hierarchies structures ideologies truths i really believe if you continue down this line in europe it's going to be an utter mess complete mess um but anyway that's going off track the point here is about worship you're right but i just want to echo about the whole health thing you know there's a prophetic tradition where the prophet muhammad upon whom peace said that god has more affection uh, for you than a mother has for her her young ones okay so that's always a kind of paradigm but yes heaven and hell are important features in the quranic discourse to agitate our thinking as well and to give us the consequences of rejecting these claims of of moving yourself away from divine mercy and grace and and away from divine guidance and it's there very clear and it allows the person to make their own decision and you know sometimes we need these psychological emotive driving forces because if you you could break everything down to pleasure and pain mm-hmm. right to a certain degree like even if someone sacrifices their life you know why did they do that because the pain of sacrificing their life for say a cause I mean obviously not suicide but you know they were on the you know say Rachel Corey I don't know if you know her maybe you're a bit young to remember who no, she was but no she was like an activist that was standing in front of the Israeli bulldozers and then she was trampled and killed right okay and you know Rachel Corey you know why is she there why is she risking her life because the pain of not doing anything was much worse than the yes. pain of doing something right yeah. you can argue it in a very basic way of pain and pleasure mm. as you know we would argue that god knows us better than we know ourselves and we're pain and pleasure driven and yes there's different levels of pain for sure um and you could detach different values and hierarchy of pain and pleasure absolutely but that's a different thing to unpack and uh, but the here the issue here is on a fundamental level god is saying look there's this divine gift that can awake which is based on divine grace fundamentally and there's this a divine alienation that if you from your free will this phenomenal gift of free will that you've been given if you use it to push yourself away from the divine like god's not going to force his special grace on you right to from a from a kind of functional um person centric perspective you know because if that's the case then it has no meaning or value it's like me putting a gun yeah. to your head saying give charity I mean, what, what, your charity has no value or meaning anymore. Right. But I just wanted to unpack that a little bit. But with regards to the worship thing, this is exactly what I do with everybody now. I, I hardly, the funny thing is, my book might change a lot in the second edition. Because I'm not saying I've had enough of the philosophy, but you know, the more you get into academia, the more you could, you're trained to split the philosophical hair. Like literally. Like you are trained, especially if you do a master's and MRS, you're doing PhD, you're trained to, take a premise and just just play around with it and make sure someone's conclusion is something totally different right so you're trained to do that especially if you do analytical philosophy right now there there is there is pros and cons to that for me i i want to engage with the human being as the human being is and the human being is not an al- is not an ai robot that you type in some kind of philosophical algorithm and you expect some kind of result that's what, what the human being is even modern cognitive science and psychology is saying well no there's you know we may claim to be rational but our claim to rationality is not that very yeah i don't, not, I, I, I don't think we are rational um exactly actually. I, I don't i don't think we are um i you know I did also want to bring up a quote. I have, I think, a couple of quotes, um, provided you finished uh, what, what you were saying, but, but I think, you know, about the worship point and, and the yeah. academia. Um, but, but I did want to um, talk about rationality, actually. 
Um, was there anything else you wanted to add to, to what you're saying? Yeah, just, just on that point, yeah. which is, the, so the approach I want to take is what you've been saying, which is based yeah. on the Quranic verse, chapter 39, verse 29, when God says, and I'm summarizing, consider the situation of two people. One man is a slave or a servant to many masters and they're all quarreling. And another man is a servant to one master whose condition is best. So, you know, my pondering over this is God is trying to say to us that if you don't worship God, the one who is worthy of worship and knows you better than you know yourself, you're going to be worshiping something else. And what we discussed worship earlier, which is, you know, there's something that you want to know the most, something, something that you focus on or recognize the most. It's like the ultimate truth for you. Something that you love the most, something that you obey the most, something that you direct internal and external acts of worship the most, like praise and gratitude. Someone has always uh, internalized these points. Like you've always at one point in your life recognized something the most, even if it's for a moment. You've always loved something the most, even if it's for a moment. You've always obeyed or referred to something the most, even if it's for a moment. You've always praised something the most, praised something or being, or you've directed gratitude, utmost gratitude towards something or some things the most at any point in, in your life. So if that's the case, that has been or is your object of worship or objects of worship. It could mm -hmm. be an ideology. It could be your yes. ego. It could be a celebrity. It could be your social circle. It could be your parents. God knows. But the point is, as Martin Ling said, man cannot not worship. So we're always in this kind of state of worship. So the Quran came down to actually solve that question. Well, this is your state because we're all contingent beings. We can't be independent necessary beings because that's God, right? We're all contingent. So we're going to be dependent on something. And not only physically and ontologically, but also spiritually and psychologically. So make choose your worship. And God says, well, God is the one who is actually worthy of worship by virtue of who he is and so on and so forth. And that's the point. So when I try to articulate myself to atheists or agnostics, I just want to plant that seed. I'm like, choose who you're going to worship. And I think mm. intuitively and psychologically and based on your innate disposition, I believe that if people really think about that properly and engage with the Quran and understand God as God describes himself, I think eventually, if they're sincere, they will come to the conclusion of like, you know what, this is this is the this is the deity that is worthy of worship, and then they start their journey. Um, so you're right; it's very phenomenal that you've actually raised that point. But talk to me about rationality. And yeah, um, so I, I think we might. Um, I think we might. Weirdly enough, I mean, it, obviously, it's not a debate, but weirdly enough, it does feel like we're we're agreeing. I mean, on the worship thing, and and because uh, I've seen again, I, I just the atheists that I've. Um, come across i mean the cosmic skeptic I, I love i love his stuff rationality rules is cool as well um uh, it's just these new atheists who, who who yeah just just don't have these good arguments but but the whole worship thing we it's funny that we are actually agreeing um uh quite quite a bit actually and uh, i was something which i think you might find interesting just before we get to the quote from your book was in in actually in the denial of death um Becker references I, Otto Rank, who was a, uh, I think he was an Austrian or may, maybe something like that, a uh, psychoanalyst. And he said, basically, at the core, men are not biological creatures, but theological creatures. And wow, I, I don't know, I just found that, you know, I, it's not like I'm, you know, from that statement alone, I'm like, like oh, yeah, theism is true. But, I, but what I am like is, okay, well, seriously, human beings are disposed to something beyond. Yes. And, and I'm not, and I, and I wouldn't for a second go as far to say that, you know, means God exists or not. But, but, but what I do think, though, is that there's something going on, whether it's, whether it's psychologically or, or beyond the psychology, which is what I'm trying to figure out, you know, it's, but there's something, there's something there, there's something worth, worth paying attention to um, that, that a lot of people just don't think about, um, essentially. Um, See, so yeah, I thought you'd, I thought you'd like that kind of that quote that we're theological beings and not biological. Very interesting way to put it. Um, so on the, let me see. Yes, okay. So in chapter three, um, you wrote that because under. So this is my brackets. You wrote that because in brackets under the materialist secular perspective of reality and brackets rationality evolved from the brain it can't be trusted in coming to rational conclusions 
but some lines further, you admit the brain is capable of rational and irrational thoughts. Could you expand on this point that you were trying to convey? Because for one second, you were saying, look, we're not we're not rational. Therefore, we can't we can't come to rational conclusions, um, which is something I, I disagree with, actually. But then you said later on that we well, I, I guess you were saying we can be rational and we can be irrational. So can you just expand on that? Do you mean we can't yeah, make rational conclusions? That, was the, conclusions? Hard, that yeah. was the hardest chapter that most people didn't understand, I think. <laughs> and uh, right. I did I did subsequent studies on things like evolutionary reliabilism and epistemology and can we trust our rational faculties? And I will change that chapter a lot, to be honest. But the main points are, is look, what is the kind of ontology or the metaphysics of the materialist or the physicalist, right? Or the philosophical naturalist, for those who mm -hmm. don't know, the one who believes there is no supernatural, there is no non-physical, there is no God, and everything can be explained in some way by physical processes. Now, if phys so physical processes, according to the naturalist, are not enchanted with any kind of magical, magical or kind of, they don't have what you would call intentional force or it's some kind of intentionality. They're not aware of themselves or aware of anything outside of themselves. They're just like mm -hmm. literally blind and cold, right? Yeah. What do I mean by blind and cold? Blind, they don't have any intentional force directing them anywhere. And they're cold, meaning they're not aware of themselves or aware of anything outside of themselves. So just from a basic kind of ontological point of view, metaphysical point of view, the source and nature of reality, how can we now justify our belief that we may hold as an assumption or as a valid assumption or as a premise or as a self-evident truth, whatever you want to call it, that we can form rational conclusions? But to form rational conclusions, you also need to have rational insights. And rational insights, human beings, when they perform rational insights, they're aware of the fact that they're having a rational insight. And they are rational about something. So there's a thinking process. It's called intentionality. It's about or of something. And this is associated with meaning. And that, for me, cannot be justified under the kind of metaphysical lenses of philosophical naturalism because it's all reduced to physical processes. But what is there about physical processes that can give rise to rational insights in the sense that we perform them as human beings? We're aware of them. They're about something of, they're about something or of something. Um, there, there's an intentional force, like say, for example, the way you, you, you make inferences or deductive arguments you take two premises and you literally take them on this kind of insightful journey in your mind and you form a conclusion. But, you know, and that's why I use a very useful example in the beginning about the, the two scenarios of, of taxi drivers, right? So the first scenario, you have a taxi driver that has a blindfold on and two passengers come at the back, call them premise number one and premise number two, yeah? And they say, hey, take us down, take us downtown. The guy's blindfolded. He's going to crash. He's not going to reach his destination, right? And this is like a nice, a nice kind of analogy or example to show what physicalism or philosophical naturalism is about. You literally have blind forces, right? Cold blind forces. Whereas the theistic approach would be more like, well, you have a taxi driver, premise number one and premise number two, get in the back and say, take me to downtown. And they can see they're fully aware of their surroundings. I know that may be a crude analogy, but I usually start the chapters with these type of analogies or stories just to get the point home. So that was the main point. So if that's the case, how can we make sense of our self-evident truth or understanding that we can make some rational insights? We're not saying we're always going to be rational. We're always going to make them accurately, but we do make some rational insights that we believe to be true. How did we get that ability to do that? And I'm saying just from the starting point, philosophical naturalism cannot really make sense of that. But yes, it gets some far more nuanced. You have this issue of evolution and you have this idea of evolutionary reliabilism, which is the idea that natural selection, you know, was more likely to select traits that produced tr tr true reliable cognitive faculties over cognitive faculties that were not reliable. Um, right. And, yeah. Yeah. So, so like, um, have you heard of Brett Weinstein's uh, metaphorical truth? 
um no. slogan it's like and it's i think it's what you're saying here it's like um acting as if something is true even though it isn't but you gain from it is that something like what you're what you're trying to convey because it, 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 feel, it feels no, similar I, well, but I'll, I'll explore that bruce what's his name oh is uh brett weinstein brett weinstein okay yeah. no it's, i'm not saying that what i'm saying here is the evolution reliabilist understands that there is no necessary connection between natural selection and truth. There's no necessary connection. For example, you can't say uh, na- na- um, uh, biological forces, natural selection is, is always going to lead to truth, right? That's not the case because you have many scenarios where you can say, well, in actual fact, n- not acquiring the truth, not following the truth, not having true reliable cognitive faculties could actually lead to survival. For example, if you're a jungle person, you're in the jungle and you believe the false belief based on your unreliable cognitive faculties that all fungi are poisonous, you're gonna survive because you're gonna avoid the fungi that are poisonous. And you also happen to avoid the fungi that are nutritious, but there's other foods for you to fulfill your needs, right? So you can have unreliable cognitive faculties you could and you could not acquire the truth or come to the truth and yet you can still survive that show and there are many other examples but that I, don't, I don't think that's wrong but yeah i i don't i don't think that's wrong um my, my i suppose what i'd follow up saying is i agree basically that i mean I, this is definitely a, a, an interesting topic to go pretty deep in but but on basis i'm i'm willing to agree that we are not basically rational creatures, but what I do think is that doesn't mean we haven't got access to being rational, provided we educate ourselves with the with the apparatus um, and and the, yeah, uh, the 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 methodology to do so. So that's kind of where I was confused because it was like, are you saying we can't be rational, or are you saying we can't justify uh, our rationality? No, I'm saying we can be rational, and right. we are rational as human beings, but can we justify that with right. philosophical naturalism or evolutionary reliabilism or natural selection? That's the question. Yes. And and although the evolutionary reliabilists are developing you know, some arguments, but generally speaking, what they say is, fine, forget the necessary link between natural selection and truth, because you, you survival and truth, because what they say is, obviously, natural selection will pick traits that are conducive to survival reproduction and you know if in order for them, for them to have the case that to justify that we have rational faculties you know you have to show that acquiring truths and having reliable cognitive faculties would always lead to survival but that's not the case it could lead to your demise so therefore natural selection could have chosen unreliable rational faculties that would lead to falsity and not truth Mm -hmm. in order for you to survive. It could be the case. So therefore they can't have a necessary link between survival and truth. So what the evolution reliabilists say is fine. We're not saying there's a necessary link. We're saying it's highly likely. So it's far more likely for natural selection to have chosen the traits that lead to rational faculties, the traits that lead to true reliable cognitive faculties, because that was more likely for you to survive. It was more likely for you to survive. Mm -hmm. However, in order for that to be unpacked, you can't just make that claim. You have to provide some kind of empirical evidence. And the empirical evidence is very, very, very shallow at at this present moment. In actual fact, when you look into the kind of cognitive sciences, you see that actually you have scholars who are saying, well, you know what? Our perceptions, the development of our perceptions were designed, or not designed, they probably don't use those terms, but they say the the fact that they are unreliable is far more conducive to our survival. There's actually a paper on this. I'll have to share it with you. Yeah. So there's some empirical evidence to show that actual fact that the evolution reliabilists may not be able to even justify their view that it's more likely that natural selection selected um, uh, true, true reliable cognitive faculties over unreliable cognitive faculties that, that led to falsity. But that there's a massive, massive discussion and debate because you have to also define, I remember I was having a discussion on Twitter with an atheist on this issue and he went for a while. And then, you know, there was so many philosophical nuances, but in terms of the purpose of that chapter, it's really to show, look, before you even discuss natural selection, before you discuss all of these things, your whole kind of metaphysics, your ontology, the lenses in, in which you put on your eyes to understand reality, 
can that give you a basis for us having rational faculties? I wasn't denying that we have rational faculties. I was mm. affirming them. I'm just denying that you have a good, you could ground those rational faculties or yes. explain them in reference to natural selection. Sorry, in reference to philosophical naturalism and even to natural selection, because it could be the case that, you know, we had unreliable uh, uh, true beliefs and they led to our survival. In actual fact, you know, the whole thing about storytelling, if you look into stories and storytelling, it's extremely important uh, with regards to the, the development of our species. And, you know, story to, and they have understood now that storytelling was based on true stories and false stories. And it was important for so many different, you know, reasons pertaining to survival of the group and therefore the individuals. So saying uh, untrue stories, right, fictional fictions was actually really important for our development. And fictions are not based on truth. You know, we don't know. Maybe it could be the case that, you know, that side of who we are, you know, not, not talking about reality, but always talking about fiction, maybe overrided, you know, the fact that we want to talk about truth. We don't know. It's hard to go back, you know, evolutionarily and unpack all of that. It's too much to, to go with this. A lot of this stuff is really theoretical. But if that's the case, um, it, could, it, it could be the case. Maybe it's likely that that was the case. So if that's the case, then we can't even ground our rational faculties. Uh, maybe we're just more, more. We have an affinity for fiction than for truth. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, I, I, I think we social do. Media, yeah. I, th I think we do. Um, uh, yeah, and social media especially demonstrates that. Um, yeah, I mean, I when you were saying fiction, uh, that there's truth in fiction. I, I definitely agree. I mean, um, you know, there's a quote saying something on the lines of like, no, no fiction author. Um, Every every book, let's say from a non-fiction author, is in some regard an autobiography, uh, autobiography because at the end of the day, they are drawing their stories from their experiences, what they've read, you know. So everything, in a sense, is autobiographical, right? Mm -hmm. And and um, uh, let's say Dostoevsky's *Crime and Punishment* um, or, or his *Demons*, let's say um, *Crime and Punishment* highlights how dangerous it is for for somebody to um, rely on the, I guess, their own standard of morality or that which they believe society is telling them is right because Raskolnikov believed what he was doing was correct. Like, oh, well, what's wrong with murdering that old woman if everybody else doesn't like her? It's like, well, there's more to it than what the crowd thinks, right? And in Absolutely. Demons, which is really cool, Demons is like really long. I, I, have you checked it out? It's like a really, really long piece by Dostoevsky. Um, I, he, he's really cool. I love I love Dostoevsky, but I do think he needed an editor, one hundred percent. It's probably mm. blasphemy me saying this for any like Russian listeners or anything like that of Dostoevsky. But my God, he di he did need he did need an editor. But in Demons, it's long, sure, but it's it's cool because like Round and Punishment, it's kind of taken on a much larger scale. Um, it's basic. Uh, have you have you read it? No, I haven't actually. It's no. it's it's really good. I mean. As I said, prepare yourself. It's long, <laughs> but wow. it is really cool um, from a political, from a historical, from a even a religious sense, because there's somebody, for example, in the book who is contemplating, you know, ending themselves and, 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 and others. And it kind of exacerbated in how their nihilism permeates everything they do and say. Mm -hmm. um, and what's cool about demons is that it's actually kind of like from a punishment, but just taken to the extreme. It's about this kind of band of people these revolutionaries and they essentially kind of come together with this greater good concept in their mind but actually what they find out is that to maintain and handle this 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 thing that they're carrying on their shoulders takes far more far more than them as an individual and as a group like it's it, like it, it it takes someone it's a heavy burden on somebody's shoulders to literally carry an ideology, carry a revolution on them. And it's really cool. Like it, it has so many, I mean, like the brothers Karamazov, I, I guess you could just say all of Dostoevsky's books, but like, it's just really good because it encapsulates that kind of idea. It's, it's this, what if scenario? What if there was this kind of guys creating a revolution and what would happen? 
Um, the nihilistic character is so interesting in that, um, uh, especially. Um, yeah. So, okay. I, th I, th I think you know. I'm. I. I'm. You know, on the you. on the evolution reliabilism stuff. Yeah. Because um, yeah. the one on Amazon is not as updated as the one that has is available as a download on the Sapiens website that's free. Yes. And with regards to evolution reliabilism. Uh, there is much more to say, and obviously it, it does get very deep uh, philosophically. Um, and you know, I don't want to paint the evolution reliabilist as as not having a position. But uh, on page sixty one, which you may not have because you may have got the Amazon version, it says a note on evolution reliabilism, and I basically talk about that. You know, what I just said earlier: many naturalists admit that there is no necessary link between survival and truth. Mm. They maintain that it's highly likely that there were biological conditions and pressures that gave rise to reliable cognitive faculties that produce true beliefs. And basically, you know, the main premise for this argument is that truth reliable cognitive faculties were more fitness enhancing, yeah, right. than unreliable cognitive faculties. However, the you know James Sage, for example, he's an academic. He argues that can't be the case because, you know. He, he, he basically argues that an organism may hide because it believes falsely that a predator, predator is nearby. Evolutionarily, it pays to have cautious belief forming processes that over detect dangerous predators, yes. especially yes. when false beliefs carry little cost. So there's a more of a biological cost, which is not conducive to survival and production. And he, and I just want to quote him on this issue. He's, and basically I say, Reli truth reliable cognitive faculties could not have been favored by natural selection as they came out as a high cost. James Sage maintains that truth reliable cognitive faculties come at a high price. And he basically says the brain requires oxygen, calories, and cooling, uh, calculated detailed inferences with minimal data requires considerable time and concentration. And he goes on and on and on. And it's a huge biological cost compared to being, you know, more, more irrational, overcautious, or, you know, um, uh, having cautious belief forming proce processes that over detect. So they're not really mm. in line with, with truth. Yeah. So the argument here is, tr since truth reliable cognitive faculties put a strain on key biological resources that are essential for survival, natural selection could have favored fitness enhancing unreliable cognitive faculties that produce false beliefs which were less taxing. Now the point is, there's much more, I don't want to straw man the evolution reliability uh, position, but the main point of that chapter, which I think needs better articulation, chapter three has always come up in people's discussions with me or, or emails mm -hmm. or whatever, and it needs a bit more rearticulation. But the main point was I said in the beginning, even before of, uh, natural selection, just the whole physicalist project and philosophical naturalism itself, can you ground the, our ability to have rational insights, given the fact that we are aware of them, given the fact that they seem to have some kind of intentional force, and those things, you can't give that to physical processes. Even, even the philosophical naturalists would admit that to you. They may argue there's some form of emergence, but then you go into consciousness and you have to deal with emergent yeah. materialism, the weak yeah. form, the strong yeah. form. And there's yeah. and I mentioned that in the book, but there's so much to unpack. Yeah. Um, it's, but I, consciousness. I, I, I like your psychological yeah. take on things though. It's 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 good. Yeah, no, the psychology is 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 extremely helpful. And I mean William James's um varieties of religious experience I've been rereading actually. Um, because I, I picked my modules at university, which was the psychology of religion, the psychology of paranormal, I think, and this, oh yeah, and then the psychology of trauma. Um, so wow. I'm kind of like I'm kind of like going back, and I'm I'm trying to reread some of my from some of my stuff that I've read a while ago, and then obviously reading new stuff. Um, and William James is really cool because he does really take it on a psychological level. I mean, he he was a psychologist, if I remember correctly. So. I think that's really important. Um, and now this, yeah, and then I'm just thinking of um, sort of revelations, um, which which is something else I, I'd probably want to ask you. Um, okay, so I, and, and by the way, I, I am actually satisfied with, with how you replied, um, with, with that reply. I, I do think that's a serious, serious thing to, to consider. I think that's an interesting uh, point you made, and I'll definitely think about that. That's worth, that's worth considering. Um, so my, my, and I guess my question, cause this is another one that I've, that, that I haven't really worked out yet, or I haven't got a satisfying response. It's like, 
you know, revelation, like a, like a Muslim might have a, let's say a dream. And then, um, and then Muhammad might, you know, appear and, and that Muslim might jump up and say, look, this is re- the reformation of, of my, of my faith. Um, and my question is, how much can we trust revelation on the basis that a Christian could do the, have the exact same experience in the night and say, oh, I saw Jesus and a, and a you know, a Jew could have the exact same experience and say, you know, Jehovah or whatsoever. Like my question is, how much can we trust revelation on, a, on an individual basis? Because to me, it's like William James would say, it's very dubious to me because yeah. when you start to endorse a Christian, uh, let, let, okay, let's just say for convenience, uh, you know, a Muslim who might experience, um, you know, God, how do we come to that conclusion that this revelation is true? Oh, but the Christians one isn't. It's like, I, I, I find that really difficult, really difficult. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, obviously, there's a difference between like revelation in terms of scripture. Yes. You know, a, a theist would argue, well, they may have internal and external evidence to show that that scripture is true. But if you're talking about personal revelation, like dreams or sure. inspiration, you know, this is a concept we have in the Islamic tradition. Ilham is like, you know, personal inspiration that one would argue was, you know, given by God in some aspects. We also believe in the power of dreams, like dreams are one, I think one forty-sixth of prophethood. So, but like with all experiences, whether they're dreams or inspiration or spiritual experiences, like my dad has many spiritual experiences, you know, uh, you know, a, a Jewish person may see a bearded person in his dream and think it's Moses, you know, a Muslim may think it's Muhammad, mm-hmm. upon him be peace, and a Christian may think it's Jesus. So what I try and do when I discuss experiences with people is I do not dismiss the experience because dismissing the experience is like dismissing the person, especially if they're connected to it psychologically. What I try and get them to do is to stand in the possibility that your lenses in, in which you have used to understand your experiences may not be the correct lenses. That's what I try and do. And usually from an Islamic spiritual perspective, these experiences, if they're positive and they've come from God, they're really experiences of oneness or experiences of understanding, you know, a certain message that links to the oneness of the divine. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by oneness here is not you being one with the divine, but you appreciating that there is a, a, a deity that is where the worship that is uniquely one. Um, so for me, it's about getting them to make a distinction between the experience and the interpretation, because sometimes Mm -hmm. people make the experience and interpretation the same thing. And that's dangerous in some way. Um, And also, you know, from the perspective of me trying to convince someone that, hey, your experience that you think it was Jesus and proving Christianity is wrong. uh, You know, you know, I, I would say that because of my own commitments that I believe to be true, but obviously you have to do in a human way, not dismiss the experience itself. So you want to make, give them the power to make distinctions, make a distinction between the experience and your interpretation of the experience. Once you get them in that possibility, they could stand up in that possibility. Then you can start discussing, right, if there is a difference between the experience and your interpretation or your lenses that you have, well, let's talk about those lenses and you can see those experiences in a different way. So you could say is, well, you know, if you still believe it was Jesus or Moses, at the end of the day, you know, there are three types of dreams in the Islamic tradition, right? Dreams that have come from God, dreams that are just based on your kind of day-to-day thinking and just knowledge, experience, what you did in the day, whatever the case may be, and dreams that have come from shaitan, uh, Satan. So, you know, you know, you could give them that lens, or maybe that dream was as a result of your frame of reference that you deal with on a day-to-day basis, which is, is Jesus or Moses, because that's your, that's your understanding, that's your frame of reference, that's your 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 reference for your theological and spiritual life so it's going to come in your dream because that's a snatcher as part of maybe your subconscious what the case may be or the dream could be such that you can give it a different interpretation and give it a different meaning that's in line with what you believe to be true so obviously i believe islam to be true so i'm going to try and give it an interpretation that is in line with um islam or you could give it the other view that maybe that's just, you know, the devil's way of taking away from the truth, right? Uh, that I comes that into sounds... unfalsifiability, though, doesn't it? Which, yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah, which is which is difficult to navigate. Um, but my, my question is to follow up on that, which is, yes. OK, but why doesn't, let's just say Islam is true and the Muslims experiencing 
Well, I mean, in what you just said, then that wouldn't necessarily be the case. But um, I mean, let's say if there is a, uh, you know, a personal revelation, why doesn't Muhammad reveal himself exclusively? Surely, surely that would just be a lot easier. I mean, now I'm kind of questioning God's will and maybe that that's a bit of muddy waters, I know. But well, not really. I, I, I mean, if, yeah. even if, you know, if God, uh, uh, you know, alludes to this in the Quran itself, right, you know, what what kind of evidence is evidence for you to be convinced? I mean, God could bring you the most strongest evidence, and you could still dismiss it as magic or as you know, yeah. Because of your state of being, your state of heart. The point is, from the Islamic perspective, we believe we have all the evidence that we need. We have two universes, right? In a way, we have three. We have the macro universe, which is you know. The, the natural world, the interconnecting principles of nature, the whole universe. You have the micro universe, which is within yourself, physically and psychologically. And you have another universe in a way, which is the book, the Quran. It's like a universe in itself that needs to be explored. All of those three things are enough for a person who is sincere and, and wants to reflect. And that's why there is a common theme in the Quranic discourse when God talks about, you know, signs for those who ponder, signs for those who reflect, you know, those who have understanding, those who are mindful of God, those who reason. And there's that theme continuously. Um, so one would argue the evidence is already there. You could, you could have all the dreams in the world that spell out the truth for you. And you'd be like, ah, this is just, uh, you know, I've had too much to drink or had a history of drugs or... You know, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, so it's been coming to my mind. I mean, you can veil the truth in any way that you want, really. Sure. So, but, but wouldn't it be a lot you... easier, though? Wouldn't it be a lot easier, though, if, if Muhammad exclusively revealed himself um, as the prophet, you know, um, and, and representing God? I mean, uh, wouldn't that be far more... Revealed um, in what way? Well, you know, instead of, let's say, a, a Christian having a dream of, of Jesus, um, it wouldn't be Jesus. It would quite literally be Prophet Muhammad and, and, and speaking on behalf of, 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 you know, the Islamic conception of God. And so surely, it, I mean, in my mind, I do feel a lot of the time that there are things that God could make easier for us to know him. And now this kind of comes into divine hiddenness and then that's a whole rabbit hole. Yeah, but yeah, I get, sure. I get, you know, but in terms of the dream, look, yeah. you know, I had this situation where a evangelical preacher, a lady, she uh, used to walk outside mosques. And from what I remember, she was saying that she used to pray for Muslims to be guided. She was like very evangelical, came from an evangelical family. Her husband was an evangelist and stuff she had a dream i think three dreams in a row on the same night she was kneeling in a mosque she was praying in a mosque and then she had a hijab on or something like that mm -hmm. that totally transformed her that for her was like this is like something else and she became a muslim she became a secret muslim kind of thing and then she came to one of our retreats that was one of like if you hear her story it was one of the most blatant signs that anyone can give you Right. I'm, I'm obviously paraphrased her story, but it was like, OK, well, this is very obvious that, you know, God is telling you you should become a Muslim because I think she prayed for the truth and to be guided in the, the subsequent dream. She got an answer or something like that. And I'm like, whoa, this is phenomenal. From what I know now, she basically went back to Christianity. Well, to, to be the devil's advocate, though, I mean, th surely there would be cases where um, a, a Muslim would be walking past church, Christian churches and they'd be thinking the exact same thing and then they would have Agreed. the exact same situation. So my question is, how how reliably and consistently can we use these personal revelations? Because, and and I, and I do agree with you in regards to I mean, Matt, Matt Dillahunty. Yeah, I mean, I, I probably, I probably put my money on that. Like we... You know, let's say if I if I did, uh, if, if I was a Muslim or something like that, I, I do genuinely feel that I, I would kind of discount that as a reliable um, access point, let's say, to, to, to that truth. Unless you have a frame of reference that you externally believe to be true that allows you to interpret that experience in the correct way. And that's why I'm focusing on the distinction between the interpretation, because even for that lady who had these so explicit dreams that is giving her answer after answer, that is like, okay, um, like, you know, if your objective is like, whoa, this is spooky, even that wasn't enough for her. Because you remember, you could, it's sort of all about your frame of reference, your interpretation. It mm -hmm. could be 
like from a Christian point of view, that's a Satan playing games with you. He wants you to move away from Jesus Christ, right? Or whatever the case may be. You can have a frame of reference that interprets your particular dream in a particular way. Yes. Fine. You can't prove it necessarily unless you prove that source of knowledge to be true. And that's why interpretation is very important. But I don't like really dismissing people's personal experiences because you just switch them off. They would not take yeah, you seriously. Sure. Like my dad has personal experiences. Many people, spiritual people or people who call themselves spiritual have spiritual experiences. Well, I'm not going to say to them, oh, you just, you've taken too much drugs or, you know, you just, you know, you've been thinking about this too much or it's from Satan. That's not the way to deal with human beings, right? So you yeah. remember, you have to individualize a human being. So what I would try and get them to do is just plant the correct seeds for them to make a distinction between the experience and the interpretation and to stand in the possibility that the lenses that they're using, the interpretation could be totally different and the meaning they're giving that experience could be totally different as well. Once you do that, you, you get them to be a bit more mature about those experiences and say, you know what, I'm not going to use that as you know primary evidence for why I should be X, sure. Y, and Z. The main evidence is those lenses in which I use to interpret the experience. So it changes the yeah. paradigm, you see? Yeah, no, I, I Yeah, do. People, people had phenomenal experience. Like I, I engaged in... Um, you know, Tibetan Buddhism a little bit before I became Muslim. And, you know, I knew of people who had family members who were Buddhists, Tibetan Buddhists, and they could have all of these very kind of spooky experiences through meditation and so on and so forth. Even in modern cognitive science now, I had a discussion with Professor John Bavaki from the University of Toronto. I mean, he's an atheist from what I understand, but he's into like things like Buddhism and I think Qi energy and you know, he's into the meaning crisis and so on and so forth. And he says there are there are models or there are uh, theories or constructs in cognitive science that can explain why people ha have those experiences, right? So again, even from a secular perspective, you ha you can have a, a, a secular frame of reference or a cognitive science frame of reference that you use the lens to understand those experiences, which would be maybe totally neutral, won't give you any kind of religious conclusion. So again, this just goes to show what is the lenses that you use to understand those experiences. And that should be the fundamental yeah. discussion, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. Let's look at the predispositions. Let's look at the, let's look at the, the a priori's. Let's, I mean, you, you were talking about that with, with Krauss as well, like, you know, the, and I, I, I don't know if you've, if you're interested in phenomenology, um, but I was reading, Maurice Malou Ponty's um, Phenomenology of Perception. And what I liked about that piece was it's really dense, but what I liked was kind of like Nietzsche, he was taking it seriously. Unlike so many modern people that I've come across, it's like he was really saying basically, um, let's just look at first principles. Let's just see if our immediate reality is even worth trusting, let alone them believing in observational facts. And I was like, that's awesome. I love that. Like, let's just look at the, let's just look at the a priori. Let, let's just look at the dispositions because that's really where it's at, because I feel like we're missing a step. Um, yes. And I think, I, th I think me and you are definitely on the same wavelength in, in that regard. The like first we're, person experience yeah. is so important though, if sure. you have the right lenses. Yeah. And that's the beauty. If you have the right, what Muslims would call it, aqidah, your creed, kind of the correct lenses to understand yourself and reality mm -hmm. then the experiences have a massive impact you need to be you need to have a, a form of experiences and that could be through prayer through the feeling of what we call the for sure which is it's very hard to define like in the prayer you should be in a state of humility and adoration to your lord that state itself is a kind of positive experience that can be transformative so those things are very important because sometimes when you abstract everything so much on intellectual abstract stuff and you have to have the correct lenses and truth, sometimes we lose the kind of phenomenological first person yeah. experience aspect. So okay. although we are saying that you need to make a distinction between the experience and the interpretation or your lenses, but you need the experience in order to make sense of the lenses as well and for you to continue and mm. to internalize and be on that path. Do you see my point? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like with anything in life, really, you know, even when you're training uh, for a boxing fight, you know, you could conceptualize how to get into the ring, what you need to do, 
But I'm telling you, if you haven't done any sparring, I don't care how smart you are. I don't care if you've got the right algorithm. You're going to lose. You need to have that first person experience, what it feels like to be punched in the face, punched in the mouth. Your instincts are getting affected. Yeah. You need you need that. You need that. I don't know if that was a healthy example. Too many violent examples. Aren't there? <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I, I'm a boxing fan. You know, I, I like martial arts and stuff like that. So, But yeah, so from that perspective, yeah, uh, I don't want us to like show to the audience that we're dismissive of experience that's 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 i i i mean even even as a future psychologist you hopefully you'll never be like that you'll get them to and that's why a good psychotherapist because in actual fact i did psychology at westminster oh. university many many years ago actually for my module for counseling i got an a i think wow nice um, and i remember my teacher telling me you're in the wrong you're in the wrong subject because i would also i would question for example, when we studied cognitive behavioral therapy or yeah. the behavioral school or the human centric approach, you know, Carl Rogers, whatever the case may be, I would go to the philosophical premise of why is this approach <laughs> a good approach? Yeah. And she was like, yeah. I, from my remember, she said, you should be doing philosophy. And it's yeah. funny. Now. I went on my philosophical academic journey. But yeah, so even in, in counseling, in good counselors sometimes, they don't try and change people's worldview per se. Mm. They try and find out what they believe to be true. If it's relatively healthy, they would use it as a reference to give them transformations. Because imagine, yeah. for example, you're a counselor and a Muslim comes up to you and says, I have this, that, and the other. And they're, they're, they're devout Muslim. Imagine you giving them like a totally different frame of reference. It's going to destroy them, right? They're going to be mm. like, I can't connect with that. So a good counselor needs to be intellectually and phenomenologically empathic to understand right, what can I anchor from their tradition in order to empower them. Yeah, right. so I think uh, yeah, uh, I think good counselors do that generally speaking. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, even when you were, yeah, no, even even when you were talking about you know talking to somebody who who may have this personal revelation, it, it also reminded me of you know when talking to clients when they kind of pr- represent or sorry present their own. Um, diagnosis or, or how they feel like um, you know for example somebody might be seeing things there might be a spider on somebody they, they feel that there's a spider on their head and and whenever they ask somebody else to um, you know for their opinion if it's there they're like no they're like you're you're kind of crazy like you need to see somebody but actually as a clinician like yeah I was talking to one of my peers about this and they were like well you need to be very careful like you were kind of saying of of you need to accept what they believe is true and then go from there and it's funny because you you very very literally kind of were on the same um uh, line of thought which is anchor with them and then you can move for, move forward because it, mm-hmm. it's like it's like in these debates isn't it like if if you're not then they're not coming from the right place um there's one debate with matt dillahunty and um oh, I forget, braxton hunter and that's probably one of my favorites actually because it came from a very um positive place it felt like the the debate was actually quite constructive and Matt Delahunty wasn't being as I don't know dismissive let's say um as he can be and uh Braxton Hunter was I actually found his answers to be quite quite worth their soul actually and I was like really impressed and then there was another one with uh, Christopher Hitch- actually probably my favorite debate with Christopher Hitchens is with um, Rabbi Warpy and another guy um, and then Sam Harris as well on near-death experiences I believe and that mm. was really cool because it felt like they were all just friends and it just it didn't feel formal it just felt like this conversation and and this the we can draw this back to many things I mean we were talking about individualism before and getting to the getting you know getting to the center of people and then working forwards and it, i think it just all comes down to this idea of remembering that we're not an island and if we mm. are we shouldn't be <laughs> because we're, we're evidently not built like that and if we and if we do stray away from people then that's quite literally bad for us um i yeah i mean i I, ha- I have a question also on um I also let me know if <laughs> let me know if you need to sleep or something I'm not sure what time it is no this has felt like half an hour yeah or 45 minutes but I know it's been it's been long but it hasn't felt that long it's been a, yeah carry on. yeah no I, I just wanted to check with you but yeah I mean it's it, it feels that way for me as well it's 
I, I wanted to talk to you about um, apostasy in Islam because I feel like this is this headline thing. Islam is a religion of peace, but it kills anyone who leaves. What is your immediate response to that kind of view? Good question. So apostasy and the concept of ridda, which is the kind of legal understanding of which is more in line with treason, they're not equivalent, they're not the same. So someone changing their mind, you're not going to basically start killing people for changing their minds. Mm -hmm. There's a different social political context concerning the, the whole concept of apostasy. So ridda, the ridda punishment or the, the penal code for ridda, which can be loosely correlated to treason is not the same as apostatizing per se, right? So if someone basically decides, okay, I'm not a Muslim anymore, and they're just gonna they're gonna just live their life normally, you know, the Islamic governance is actually not part of political, social, individual ethics to spy on people and you know have an inquisition and find out, you know, what are your beliefs, you know, stuff like that. It's that uh, the practical application of Islamic law has never been like that. In actual fact, when someone spies on you and in your home you're doing something that is worthy of a punishment, you can't be punished because the person who's been a witness to your, 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 your crime, if you like, or your immoral act or whatever you want to call it, he's not now a worthy witness because he spied on you. Mm. <laughs> so it's not valid in the court of law. So yeah. it has been what I would call... Um, what's the right word to use? Um, I don't know. I don't know what word to use, but it's been over. It's been what's that? Sen uh, over sen sen was it? Uh, it's sensational. Yeah, right? that's it. Yeah, yeah. Sen it's, it's sensationalized. It's, yeah, sensationalized. Yeah. That's the word, right? To use. I know it's a bit late now, but you know. Now, don't get me wrong. Those punishments do exist. I'm not going to deny that it's part of orthodoxy is part of the fact that if you go out there and you rebel against the community and you rebel against the state and you're an apostate in that sense through a court of law, there is a due process. And then there is, you know, a, 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 a punishment in the Islamic context. But here's the problem. The problem is this. When we look at Islamic law, and there are very few penal, penal codes, very few punishments, right? When we look at Islamic law, what we do, we take the law in abstraction and we apply it in a second liberal context. I would even agree if you take, for example, the law for stealing or for the law of, you know, fornication and mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, and you apply it in a second liberal context, I would have the same reaction as any normal person. They were like, okay, this is not making sense to me. What's going on here? Everyone's hand is going to be cut off and so on and so forth. But we have to understand that there is a total different political legal philosophy underpinning the Islamic model. So for example, number one, it's not a liberal society. So generally speaking in an abstract sense, you know, ideologically and philosophically, liberalism has this kind of position of you know, neutrality concerning the conception of the good life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obviously in practice, that's not the case, but you know, they generally, they should have a conception that no, the government or those in, in power can't have a conception of the good life. And the assumption is that human beings are individuals and they're rational. And there's a, there's a marketplace of competing values and the best values will manifest themselves. Yeah. But it can't be pushed by authority. Yeah. Generally speaking. Now, Islam doesn't, it's not, it's not, it's not liberalism that obviously there's totally different histories different philosophical uh, you know premises and foundations and islam actually does push a conception of a good life for instance and you could argue that if there is no push for conception of a good life even on a basic level then those with power can manipulate society and we've actually seen that happen anyway especially when it comes to morality and social norms but different discussion so you have the underlying you know we have a conception of a good life those values, whether you call them cohesive values or whatever the case may be, are propagated. Yeah? Then on top of that, you have a structure in society that has mechanisms in society to prevent a violation of law or a violation of those values. Then on top of that, you have a justice system that is not just based on reasonable doubt, but rather it has stringent criteria because if there is any doubt, then you can't have the punishment, right? And that's, that's the thing about the Islamic tradition based on the prophetic teaching 
that you know it's better to you know free nine people who deserve punishment than have one innocent person basically being punished and on top of that then you have what are called suitably harsh punishments in that context so all of the penal codes whether it's ridda um, you know whether it's treason whether it's um, uh, stealing it's in that context. So they have to escape the conception of good life which creates a social, social structure and social norm and some kind of social consensus. And you have to escape then those values being propagated. Then you have to escape the mechanisms in place to prevent the crime from happening in the first place. Then you have to es escape a very kind of a detailed uh, uh, ju uh, ju uh, uh, legal system that is not just based on beyond reasonable doubt. If there is any element of doubt, you can't have the punishment in the first place. And then you have the punishment at the end, which is seen as a deterrent rather than wanting it to be enacted. And that's why in Islamic history, very difficult to find people being punished in that way especially in the early, early early history of Islam, because it was the philosophy of, of the penal code was more about a deterrent, which even the Quran talks about, rather than we want everyone to be, you know, uh, you know, for example, have their hands chopped off, for instance. And not just that, in order for even the punishments to be enacted, there are stringent criteria. Some of the criteria include, you, it's, you didn't do it for hunger when it comes to theft, for example. It had to be over a certain value. Um, if it was in a public place, then the punishment, punishment is not enacted. You have to take it from a private place, from what I remember. But you could check this out for yourself when you read a book on Islamic law. So there's all these stringent criteria. And even in some cases, people would argue you had to know it was wrong, <laughs> right? So, so the point here is when you, when you put all that into context, you may still disagree with it. But at least you've understood the crime and punishment in the context of the Islamic model. Because what we do, especially as secular folk, not that I'm secular, but I was brought up in a you know, neoliberal humanist secular family. I empathize with that. I get it. Because if you take the law in abstracto, in abstraction, and you throw it into a secular liberal paradigm, you're like, what the flip is happening here, right? But when you appreciate that there are all these little structures and layers of the society, and you understand the philosophy of crime and punishment in the first place, which is more about prevention and deterrent rather than in enacting uh, the punishment, then the paradigm changes at least. You may still disagree with it because like, well, I disagree that you should have a conception of a good life. I think that human beings are rational and they should make up for themselves. Fine, but that becomes a different discussion. So sometimes what we do, we zoom in on the particular punishment in the context of a secular liberal paradigm and we don't understand it within the Islamic legal pattern. That's why when I speak to atheists sometimes, like, have you read a book on Sharia law? So, well, fine, read one first, then then talk. You, 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 asked, you asked Lawrence Krauss, has he read a book on Sharia law? I remember that. And uh, and he had and he hadn't. Yeah, it's yeah. Like for example, it's... my library was full of atheist books. At least I took time to read the atheist perspective yeah. or an yeah. atheist perspective. I don't, I, I'm not saying I got it right, but at least sure, yeah. have the epistemic duty to read about people's tradition. So, um, and there's also, for example, Muhammad Hijab has written a book on Ridda in our context, and he's based it on the Islamic uh, classical tradition and the prophetic uh, model. And he's argued that in modern state scenarios, there could be treaties between two, and like, I don't want to misquote him, but you'll have to read the book. Um, it's available on Amazon. There are treat if there's treaties between, for example, a state that is governed by Islam and it has Islamic governance, and for example, a, a liberal state, there could be a treaty where you say any apostate, and what we mean by apostate in this context, that they want to publicly say that I'm an apostate, which could therefore be seen as treason, that person can be exiled to uh, a, a liberal or secular country, and there's no punishment enacted upon them. The point here is when you look at Islamic law and you apply it, you, it's the difference between law and applied law. So the whole point of Islamic scholarship is to apply the law in the context that we find ourselves. Right. Now, it could be the same as it was applied a thousand years ago, or it could be different, but it depends based on the context. And that's why things like you know state treaties can come into play here. There's so many other nuances. And that's where I would draw the line and basically say, I'm not a legal jurist. But so I can't give you the full answers on this, but what I can do is at least give you the appreciation of what I've just done now 
is that when we look at anything to do with crime and punishment in the Islamic system and model, you have to see it within those kind of layers and structures and the philosophies that I spoke about. Because if you just take it in abstraction, you throw in a liberal secular paradigm, it will be very, very problematic. And it's also about understanding our conception of tolerance, right? There is no such thing as a boundless tolerance. No one's going to say that. I mean, any liberal secular society would understand that too. And we would argue, well, where do you draw the tolerance boundaries? And what, what is what you call the maslaha and mafsada? And this is Islamic ethics. What is increasing the well-being for the collective and decreasing the harms for the collective? Mm -hmm. And when you look at Islamic law in the context that I've just discussed, it just increases the well-being of the collective and decreases the harms uh, the suffering for the collective and obviously that requires a further kind of utilitarian discussion yeah, yeah. but the yeah. point but the point here is um uh yeah so the point here is when you understand it in that context it, it's 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 it, it at least allows you to stand in the possibility that okay i may not still like it because i have liberal sensitivities but uh oh sorry yeah i was talking about boundaries of tolerance so there is no boundaries of tolerance. so like for example in an islamic paradigm in many cases, you would see Islamic law to be far more tolerant than any secular liberal state. For example, Russia is fighting Ukraine at the moment. Yeah? If a Russian soldier that has massacred Ukrainians was invited by a person, a, a citizen of Ukraine, to come into Ukraine to stay there for three months and do trade, that would not be allowed. That just won't be allowed. In Islamic law, that's allowed which is phenomenal. You could read, he, he comes from a Christian background. His name is Wael Halak. He wrote the book Sharia Law. And he mentions this is unprecedented tolerance, something like that. Basically, it's called anyone from a state that's governed by uh, Islam, an individual citizen can invite an enemy combatant, right, who's engaging in warfare at the moment, invite them to, I don't know, the empty Romo house next door or something and say, why don't you come here for three months and do some trade and go back? That's allowed in Islam, right? Now, one would argue, oh my God, that's like, this is like, you would not even find this in probably any secular liberal uh, understanding, yeah, of, 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 of you know, engaging in, in, in live war with an enemy combatant and that to happen, right? The reason I'm mentioning this as an example is just for you to stand in the possibility that where we draw the tolerance boundaries there may be some similarities between different ideologies, but there could be certain differences as well. And really, and in reality, those differences exist because of the fundamental intellectual foundations of the tradition. Like, you know, let's be honest, bro. In a secular liberal society, generally speaking, religious minorities, if they want to express themselves as themselves, as they truly are, it's going to be very hard for them to be part of mainstream society. Why am I saying this? Because under secular liberal structures, generally speaking, and there are uh, exceptions, generally speaking, religious minorities are accepted practically and socially as a secularized and liberalized version of themselves. As a secularized and liberalized version of themselves. There is a dominant culture. They have to become a subculture within the dominant culture. And that, is a kind of collective subconscious intolerance to a degree. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, with the Islamic paradigm, if you look at the Ottoman history, yes, there were there were bound the boundaries to tolerance, but you know, it's unprecedented. You had Islamic law allowed Jews to go to the rabbinical courts, Christians to go to the Christian courts, and they could they could chose to go to the state courts, which were the Islamic courts. And if you look at the Jewish historian Amnon Cohen, he wrote a book, um, A World Within, it's a two volume book. He collected, I think 19th century, 1000 sigil records, okay, of the Ottoman uh, legal, um, legal documents. And as a Jew, he concludes that the Jews had the freedom to go to the rabbinical courts, but many of them went to the Qadi, the Islamic courts, to the point, if I remember correctly, with Jewish women would go to the Islamic courts and complain of maintenance, right? Now, this is not me saying it. This is really, it's, and it's got a, a world within the documents. These are historical documents. Now, that was, a, that was allowed to happen because of a particular conception of tolerance and allowing a minority to express themselves to a greater degree than they can 
in liberal secular societies. In liberal secular societies, you don't generally have that, right? So there was, so this goes to show that yes, tolerance boundaries, there may be some similarities, but there are also some, a lot of differences. And the reason mm. those differences are there because they come from a different source and Muslims say they come from the divine. And that should be the real discussion. Now, I know this is going off on a tangent, but I want to give you that conceptual framework in order for you to continue your journey to understand that it's not as simple as saying, oh, that's a law and I'm going to apply it in my own second liberal context and boom. And, and we just have to understand that it's far more deeper and nuanced than that from that perspective. And we see it, even in Islamic history, in Islamic Spain, for example, you have Jews, Christians and Muslims working together to look into the interconnecting principles of nature. You know, academics called it a convivencia, coexistence. They called it paradise on earth, right? Some of them. You have Musa bin Maimun, Maimonides, who was like, he's considered the second Ju uh, Moses of the Jewish tradition. And he was a Jewish scholar. He wrote in Arabic. He was from Islamic Spain. Um, Adam Smith, like the founder of modern capitalism, talks about, you know, uh, Islamic governance, as you know, it's, it's tolerance and it's a kind of worldview that produces all of this stuff. It's his words himself in one of his essays. Um, fine, you could say that's anachronistic because some of these guys may have had, you know, conservative perspectives, but there's something there. There's something there to explore further and explore, okay, what makes, what, what, what made Europe, Europe? You know, because you know, I, as, yeah. I mean, I also want to. Sorry to interrupt. I, I also no, 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 want to look into the. Long, I, I also want to look into the Islamic Golden Age as well. Um, I, I've I've got a friend, um, uh, Shea, um, and he he's like, he's he's probably uh, he he's a big fan of yours. He's like a profound fan of yours. And he when I when I told him I was going to talk to you, he was like, oh my god. Um, but he <laughs> he's actually the guy who's responsible for um, educating me about about Islam um, and and kind of helping me not only think about Christianity, because, you know, in the West, it's very easy to to think, oh, Christianity. But but actually there's, you know, there's Islam there, which is, as you were kind of saying that, you know, Western civilization isn't merely from Christian <laughs> influence. Um, let's just not pretend that. Uh, it's, so, yeah, I mean, I, I have I have uh, a lot of research to do in the in the golden age of of Islam and how that works because mm. you know I, I have heard you know my friend right. um, Sherb he, he he mentioned look look at this example of Islam working. He, he's a Muslim uh, by the way, and and um, as you would have guessed, I, I suppose. But he uh, he he has said look at the golden age and, and investigate that because clearly that's an example of tolerance and clearly that's an example of the the islamic tradition being successful and and, and working in various ways um and, and so i would really like to look into that and i i'm very um satisfied with you know with the answer that you gave about apostasy i think that's a really interesting response um i'm definitely gonna gonna read more about that um and I'll probably go back afterwards and get all these book <laughs> recommendations written down. Yeah, of course. And, um, you know, read, read Hijab's book on the Ridda, which is yeah. on, like uh, uh, treason against the state. I mean, treason is not the best way to describe it, but it's better than calling it apostasy. Um, because many people, when they think apostasy, it's like, oh, you're just changing your mind. But it's a little bit more than that. Also, with regards to even conception of tolerance, remember, when we say tolerance as a word, we have our own ideological, emotional, philosophical baggage on that term. So yes. we may have a liberal conception or a secular conception. Yes. But as I, the reason I want to give you these examples is to show that there is, there may be some correlation, some commonality on what we mean by tolerance, mm. but fundamentally the manifestation and expression of it and the, and the boundaries to tolerance which exist everywhere will be defined by your worldview. That's the yes. important thing that could raise, yeah? And that's why I raised the issue of, you know, someone from a country that's, governed by islam which doesn't really exist today really but you know they could invite an enemy combatant to chill out for three months and do trading and they could go back and you can't harm them by the way they're protected and, and that is like to show that well this is this is like left field tolerance right and i'm using that as an example just to highlight the point of yeah we'll use a word but that word is a vehicle to meaning which represents something maybe different because we have different frames of reference you know yeah no no completely i i, I get what I get what you're trying to convey there. And, and I think on a similar vein, um, this segues into, into another thing that I want to mention, which is 
the relationship between Muhammad and Aisha, that that's another controversial thing. And and I think I've I think I heard Mohammed Hijab actually say it's abusing the fallacy of presentism, um, saying basically comparing Western um, uh, ideas and, and lenses, like in your own words, actually, um, to the past and saying, well, how, you know, blaming somebody basically for, for values that was was commonplace. Although I'm not fully convinced by that because, and for anyone else, I would be. But the very and I and I really want your response to this because I, I I find this to be I haven't found a response to my uh, response if that makes sense yet um, if if there is one of course but um, provided Muhammad was divine and he is a prophet of God now my standard would be okay if Muhammad is a prophet of God if he is the prophet of God I understand. The, the, the presentism point but what I don't think what doesn't rub me the right way is that he didn't know better or he didn't think oh well maybe this isn't a great decision let's consummate the marriage when she's like 16 or something you know maybe this isn't a great idea um mm. I I've I've had a few discussions about this topic and I think there are a few avenues to go through which is you know for example biology like when when do when do women mature right? you know all, all of this sort of thing um but I guess I guess that's what I'm trying to um you know ask you basically what do you what do you think of that do you what do you think of my analysis of that yeah I mean I think the whole I think the whole thing is a non-issue and I, and let me try to explain this because when you, when you look at the sunnah, meaning the life, the teachings, the actions, the ethics, the, and the principles of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace, you, from a scholastic perspective, you never reduce his sunnah, his way, to one incident, unless you only have one evidence for a particular issue. But when you look at the issue of marriage, the issue of age of consent, of consummation and stuff like this, there are far more evidences that you have to bring in to understand yeah. what is the prophetic way. It's actually really simple. And I think what we've done as Muslims, we've adopted the inaccurate or, or, or false epistemic assumptions. Let's just be very clear. In order for uh, uh, consummation to take place in the context of marriage, they have to be physically, there should be no harm. There's a general, it's called a usuli principle, a principle of jurisprudence. There is no harming and no reciprocating of harm. This includes psychological and physical. So I guarantee you, if there was any psychological, physical harm, it wouldn't have happened, whether she was 9, 10, 15, 55, or 150. Yeah, age is arbitrary. Age in this context is arbitrary because you have to apply the principle. So the thing is that there's no harm no psychological, no physical harm, which came out to be the case, by the way, because she was like responsible for one fourth of Islamic jurisprudence or something. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two, there, there must be physical readiness, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a fact. Yeah. Number three, social acceptance. Yes. In Islamic jurisprudence, urf, urf means social kind of custom is determinative in Islamic law. This is a, again, usuli principle. It's a principle of Islamic law. Social custom is determinative, meaning it can formulate your ethical moral, moral, moral values. In that culture, she was, it wasn't going to affect her psychologically or physically. She was physically ready. She had spiritual mental readiness. And her father said, she's ready now. The community was a normal thing, right? Now, can you do that in this context? It will be immoral to do it in Britain. Why? Mm -hmm. Because let's apply the principles. Uh, is there any harm physically or emotionally? Is there biological readiness? And is there social acceptance? If you apply those three principles, then you get your moral value in Islam. So that's why someone says to me, would you allow your daughter to marry, uh, your, your nine-year-old daughter to marry uh, an older man? Like, no, because... Islam teaches me these three more these three principles to apply in this context. Simple as that. Game over. And we can show in actual fact that when you apply those principles to Aisha radiallahu anha, may God be pleased with her, there was biological readiness, there was no physical or emotional harm, and there was social, social, social acceptance. And this, that's all evidence, not only based on Arab custom, 
based on European custom, my friends. A lot of Europeans married eight year olds, nine year olds, 10 year olds, it's all in the legal documents, right? Even in, up to the 18th century, I believe, or 19th century. So it's a bit self defeating when you have these Islamophobes saying, oh, Muhammad was blah, 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 this and that. I'm like, hold on a second, man. You're shooting yourself in the foot. You know, all of your great great grandmothers were, <laughs> you know, for you to be sure. here today is because of a whole. So for me, people have misunderstood the moral principles and the law of, of the legal system of Islam. It's, this, is, this is, by the way, not me making this up. This is what the usuli, the kind of uh, legal jurist, the legal, what's called, the moral, moral legal philosophers or moral legal uh, sco scholars in the tradition, they have uh, derived these principles from the prophetic practice itself. So these three principles are either from the Quran or from prophetic practice. There is no harming, no reciprocating of harm. And or social custom is determinative, obviously, in certain context, there's a way to apply it. And obviously, there needs to be physical readiness. Game over. It's just, there's nothing else. Obviously, from our perspective, and that's where the anachronism comes into play, our perspective is, and this is why it's really good, because one day, I, uh, my wife basically was asked this question. They asked her some let me just use this language, it's getting a bit late now. So some Muppet, yeah? All right. All <laughs> so right. Muppet came up to my wife and said, oh, you know, Muhammad, you know, slept with a nine-year-old or whatever. And then uh, she turned around and said, um, well, he said, oh, can you marry a nine-year-old? Or what? Oh, he married a nine-year-old. And he said, well, or he said something like, oh, was Aisha nine? And she was, she turned around and said, well, what age did you, do you want her to be? That stunned him. Because he was like, whatever age he gives is arbitrary. And, I, and, and for me, I'm going to be honest, authentic with you, that shows the profundity of the Islamic model. Because age of consent, for example, in the secular system, in one country, you're going to be a pedophile, man. Yes. Because yeah. it's, it's, it's madness. Like, in, I think in Spain, you get married at 12. In, in New York, if you've got permission of parents, it's 14. In some places, 21, 18. The point is, it's an arbitrary number. For us, the number is almost irrelevant. What's important is the principle. And if you apply these principles that I've just given you, bro, some 35-year-olds are not fit to get married. Are not fit to get married. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, like some me, people aren't, uh, you know, like, like some people aren't uh, good to have kids or, or whatever, you know, there, yeah, there are certain sure. perimeters that, that, so that makes a parent. Prin yeah, it's yeah. very principle-based. And it's not arbitrary because when you always put a number to something or an arbitrary figure, then you're going to end up with inconsistencies. And I think it's far more important to be principle based. Is there that social acceptance? Does it, is there harm psychologically or physically? Is there biological readiness? These are really good principles to apply. And generally speaking, the average kind of number might be 19, 18, 17, 21, who knows? But it's, 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 it's specific, you know, and this is the moral legal reasoning of the Islamic tradition. So given that is the case, I don't even see this as a problem, man. Like literally, I don't see it as a problem. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, I definitely see what you mean in terms of there's more context to this, that there's, there's principles to actually to look at here. I suppose for me, um, the, the consent thing is important. Um, like to, to what level you know, developmental stage can someone give consent? And I think that's more of a subjective question than than, than people make it out to be. Um, because, it, you know, you could say consent of a 30-year-old is, is, is imbalanced, for example. Um, somebody might not ha be in the right headspace to make that decision or, or, yeah, for sure. or a function, you know, in, in a functional level, not just in a, um, a, te a temporal one. Um, well, you, should, you should ask that question to the people who are, you know, ideological... You know this whole ideological trans movement that you have eight-year-olds who have gender dysphoria yes and they think just by virtue of having gender dysphoria they're allowed now to be on a journey to fundamentally do irreversible changes to the biology uh you know i don't see the people who've been complaining about the age of aisha complaining about this yeah we need to be consistent right for god's sake they can't even vote they can't even you know Today's eight-year-old, by the way, yeah, maybe eight-year-olds a thousand years ago are different because the social context is different. But the they would be more developed, I'd imagine. 
Well, yeah, that biologically that has been the case as well. They, they were more developed for yeah. sure because of the food, the kind of environment, um, for sure. But the, but the issue I'm trying to say here is, you know, this interesting issue of consent, it doesn't really come up much when it comes to these ideologues, right? Um, and, you know, I have my obviously, you know, position on this issue. I think it's, I think it's child abuse, frankly. I'm going to be honest. If someone's an eight-year-old and has gender dysphoria, you don't start them as an eight-year-old to start having irreversible biological changes to 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 who they are. They, they can't vote. They can't get married. They can't smoke. They can't drink. <laughs> I mean, like, mm. shocking. Like I'm a parent. I'm thinking this is like unbelievable. It doesn't make any sense to me. But the reason I'm mentioning it now is because. It also goes to show the inconsistency of some ideologues. You know when ideologues point the finger about certain issues? Well, when you take the logical underlying basis of what they're saying, well, they should apply it to other aspects of their worldview and they will see that inconsistency, you know? Um, but yeah, so it's not just about context. It's literally about legal reasoning and moral reasoning. This is the moral reasoning of Islam when it comes to these issues no psychological or physical harm, biological readiness, social acceptance. When you apply that, you may get a range of ages for people across time. But in our context today, if someone said, oh, would you allow your nine-year-old daughter? I say, no way, because my nine-year-old daughter doesn't fulfill any of those criteria. Number one, there's no social acceptance. And that's determinative in this context. Number two, um, there is, uh, she's not physically or mentally fit and she's probably not even biologically fit. So see you later, mate. Right. Do you see my point? Um, so when you apply it, you see the non-arbitrary nature of the Islamic tradition. And yes, you could argue it, it can be misapplied. But that happens because you don't have good political structures in place. Yeah. It happens because you don't have accountability. Just like in our culture in the UK, law could be misapplied. You know? And yeah. look at lobbying groups, right? You know, we claim, you know, the developing world is full of uh, corruption, but there's a lot of corruption in our country, but it's as hidden as lobbying and financial transactions. And we saw this with the COVID crisis, right? Some guy giving some person a contract. He has never dealt in this domain of business, of medical, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, products before. And you're giving him this massive contract. I mean, come on, man. So, you know, we're human beings, man. We're going to make errors. And yeah. And I would speak out against it as well. If it doesn't, hasn't followed those principles and there's no that right accountability, that would be abuse for sure, 100%. Because if they're not physically fit, not mentally, psychologically avail uh, ready, and there's no so kind of, you know, that kind of orf, that social custom, then yeah, that would be deemed as immoral in Islam. Yeah, well, you've, you've given me a lot of food for thought. Um, I, I find... Like in your book, it, it feels like this process has been duplicated in the sense that what you've been saying, I definitely understand your justifications and your, the, the, the way that you're seeing things I can get behind. And, and for that reason, I need to think more about it because you've given me a lot to consider uh, and to reconsider, um, because it just seems to me that on this whole religious, you know, Christianity even and, and uh, religion in general, there's just... The, the thing that new atheism did was made it cool to be a dissident to made it cool to say i don't believe in god made it cool you know like a nietzsche with sunglasses or oh, yeah, a, uh, atheism mm. and nihilism it's like i don't know i mean the implications aren't so cool um but i i just live with that you know because i have to not not because i want to I, i'm just i'm just not convinced at the moment anyway of uh you know of the alternative um, in your book, you do talk about the implications of, of atheism, and it's not like I don't agree. It's more, well, I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't not agree with you. I suppose it's just, it's, it's like, yeah, I get it. Basically, <laughs> it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. The implications isn't they, they aren't cool. Um, you know, the whole moral thing. You know, like Hitchens always got wrong. Oh, you're you're saying I'm immoral. No, the theist is saying you can't justify your morality. Like he got that wrong so many times. Um, and 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 I, I do think the justification of of the atheist's life is pretty dubious at best. Um, but what I have to concede um, to myself anyway, and then atheists who think about this issue, is that look, it's the best we have. And in your book, when you were saying about the implications of atheism, I was like. 
I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, that's true. But I can't really do much about that. You know, it's, it's sad. <laughs> it's uh, worrying. Yeah. I mean, you in know? the context of that chapter, I did mention that it's not really a kind of rational argument as we define rationality. Yeah, of course. I agree. It does yeah. provide the kind of existential and emotional. Yes. Um, motivation to start taking theism yes. seriously or ideas very seriously yeah and there's a lot of the implications are what you would argue counterintuitive because a lot of philosophy or ideas or you know world views are based on like intuitions they may be skewed but that it's based on intuitions and when it comes to things like you know human beings have value now, under philosophical naturalism it is almost impossible I mean, vegans have an argument under philosophical naturalism, right? I think they're more, they're more consistent under philosophical naturalism than some atheists, because at least they're saying, well, we're the same as animals, right? Because we're just like carbon rearranged in different ways or electrons rearranged in different ways. And why would we say we're more important than anybody else? It's right. a form of speciesism, right? Yeah. You know, and why would you? Because if it's just fundamentally blind, cold physical processes arranged in different ways and causally connected in different ways, well, why would that give you more value than another? unless you have something external to physical processes that, that is a reference for value. And if that's the case, then physicalism collapses. So vegans really are your, are your ideal philosophical, <laughs> philosophical <laughs> naturalist, man. Yeah, I'm no different from, uh, from a bumblebee. Well, what, I I, what I say you know, to, to people, I mean, I, 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 on a personal level, it, and for the viewers, um, I don't think I've mentioned it when we've been recording, but I'm, I'm currently vegan, um, or at least, you know, a proponent of eating as many animal product, uh, non-animal products as possible, just to minimize, minimize things. Um, but, but, but again, this whole thing is about minimizing and there's a lot, there's a big kind of straw man, which you may have noticed anyway, with, with the whole thing. It's like, oh, you can never be true vegan because you're always gonna, gonna harm something anyway. It's like, well, it's not really the point. The point is to, to recognize that. And me personally, I don't believe that I'm necessarily more important than a pig or if I am or not, but even if I did, I don't believe that gives us a justification to eat them arbitrarily because it tastes nice for two minutes. It's like, uh, um, and, and so it's weird because some vegans would say, yeah, I'm on the same level as a pig. I have the same value. It's like, for me, I don't necessarily think that because I feel like, you know, a human being, um, a human animal has consciousness, has far more, you know, potential. Let's say, um, but at the same time, I don't think that justifies factory farming or, or eating them arbitrarily. Um, so, yeah, with the yeah. issue of the ethics of overconsumption and factory farming and the way animals are treated, like Islam, obviously rejects the philosophy of re veganism, but it does accept some of the ethics, like you know some of the animals that are being treated is contrary to the Islamic tradition. Some the way they're slaughtered is contrary to the Islamic tradition. The way they're fed, um, the overconsumption is blameworthy in the Islamic tradition. Now you could even say the Prophet Salaam was like a quasi vegetarian, like he wouldn't eat meat all the time. Although one of his favorite dishes was a meat dish, but you know, for months sometimes he'll be like on aswadin, you know, the dates and water, or there'll be no smoke coming out of one of the, 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 the house of one of his wives meaning nothing cooking yeah mm. so you know so it, it, we have become very kind of greedy and capitalist concerning me and the treatment of yeah. animals for sure and a lot of it is technically you could argue is that meat even allowed to eat islamically so yeah i agree with that from the kind of ethical practical perspective but the philosophy no but the reason i wanted to mention about the whole veganism thing that mm. is more consistent with philosophical naturalism because under philosophical naturalism, everything is basically reduced to in some way to physical processes and physical processes that we mentioned before are blind and cold. If that's the case, then how can we justify the intuition that we have some kind of value? Because, it, because value? and this leads back to another thing that you said, which is, and I disagreed with, it. I would reply, well, it works. By treating people as if they have value, it practically works to function in a society like that. And so my perspective is, well, just use a mixture of what we've done well in the past, use a bit of utilitarianism, like use a bit of di different disciplines and then come to a reasonable conclusion about how to treat people consensually. Mm -hmm. And so my response is, well, why don't we just use multidisciplinary um, uh, modes of ethics, you know, Kant and, and, um, and, uh, and uh, 
utilitarianism and things like that and just combine them to come to the best possible conclusion um of, of what might be true and to on the back of that you said um i think i've got the the quote i just wanted to uh, ask you about this it's kind of similar to something that we discussed before um okay okay on page 19195 of your book um you wrote it does not logically follow that a scientific theory or conclusion is true just because it works end quote now could you expand on this for example i think that we can assume something's true if it works such as the fact that it is true that my car works when i drive it regardless of me understanding the intricate uh, mechanics of the machine do you, do you have any thoughts yeah, on that no, yeah i mean there's more nuance to it because i was questioned by a learned philosophical atheist that he thought i was straw manning the philosophy of science right because it is true that most philosophers of science are scientific realists so they do believe a workable theory that's well confirmed that has predictive power is a representation of the actual state of affairs, meaning it's true. But they do have the caveat because they know there's no necessary link between something working and it being true. Because we know that with workable theories that were eventually found out not to be true. And in actual fact, even if you look at the atheist Elliot, Elliot Sober, the philosopher of science, I think specifically he's a philosopher of biology as well. He makes the point that previous theories that uh, were that were working, uh, they they can have more predictive power than current theories or something like that. So it does get a little bit more complicated when you're going into the domain of theories, scientific theories. Mm -hmm. Yes, generally speaking, if something is well confirmed, it has predictive power, and it's a successful theory, you can have the default position to say, well, yeah, that's a representation of reality. But what do you mean by that? Do you believe there is a necessary link between that? And truth or do you mean that it's far more likely and in reality you're saying it's far more likely yeah my i'd agree is, yeah yeah my main point is no one's going to deny the fact that workable successful series should you know uh, no one's going to say we shouldn't accept them practically but i'm saying philosophically you don't have to accept them what you there's no you, you don't have to be a scientific race you can be an instrumentalist you could believe that these workable successful models are just like workable theories to give us approximations of truth, no problem, because we have a pixelating understanding of reality. And when you look at the history of science, you know that's even workable successful theories changed over time. And that's the beauty mm -hmm. of science. Who said that science has to inform your creed and your philosophy and your metaphysics? No one's saying that. And that's the problem with current day discourse, that science has become, you know, your source of everything. They think it's gonna, you know, it's gonna pay your taxes. It's gonna iron your 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 shirt. It's gonna get you married, and it's gonna tell you how to, you know, treat your wife. With all due respect, science is a domain, and it has its domain of knowledge, the domain of knowledge. So, and it doesn't have an ought either. Yeah, I mean, it can inform an ought, right? It can inform mm. your morals, like you know, especially if you include suffering and well-being in, as part of a more complex. You know, more yeah, I'm not convinced of Harris's thesis yeah harry harris is uh harris got annihilated by dr craig on that issue like literally it's probably one of the only debates dr craig like really well he's done well in many of his debates but on this one it was like, philosophically embarrassing it was it was literally philosophically embarrassing um but sam harris is not more a philosopher and, and from what i remember he was not quoted once in uh, academia so he's, he's he's a popularist let's be honest he's a neuroscientist and not a very good one on that according to some people but he's changed now he's become more of a spiritualist <laughs> yeah more of a kind yeah. of a new atheist guru now um but look the the issue here is um yeah so you're right uh, i'm gonna that chapter is gonna change slightly although the essence of what i've said the conceptual framework of what i've said i totally believe in but i want it to be more representative of mainstream philosopher science more most philosopher science are realists when they do believe that Yes, because it works, it's actually proof that it's true as a default, but it cannot be as well. Right. Uh, but sure. my main point was to show there is no necessary link, which they would agree with me, because they're not uh, infallibilists. They don't believe that, you know, theories are infallible. Yeah? I, no, I agree. I agree with you um, for sure about this kind of, I guess it's scientism, saying like, oh, well, yeah, this, this is... 100% of like certainty you talk a bit about certainty about how yes. we, we should try try and avoid 
that claim of like oh well evolution is certain i mean it's it's most it's most probably very true and and it's demonstrated to be one of the most if not the most demonstrated um uh, thesis of 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 science but that doesn't mean there aren't plot holes in it or or you know things to work yeah, on. i mean look evolution technically speaking is biological change Darwinism is the mechanism to explain biological change and neo-Darwinism or Darwinism in general, it's not perfect. No academic would say that. There are, it's probabilistic. It has a, some yeah. philosophical assumptions and there are some disputes on certain areas, maybe not the main areas, but certain areas. So some of the philosophical assumptions include gradualism. Gradualism is actually a philosophical assumption that reads into the data. The data doesn't give you the conclusion, it's the other way around. So in philosophy of biology, which is a growing field, it exposes some of these philosophical assumptions. So to come across that Darwinism is like uh, the gospel truth is actually wrong. It's, even Dawkins, bless him, yeah? <laughs> he doesn't even say that. In his book, I think it's called the A Devil's Chaplain or The Devil's Chaplain, yeah. he actually mentions this point. He says, makes a distinction between like evolution, biological change and kind of Darwinism, I believe. And he says, look, in the future, we may get evidence that changes Darwinism altogether to the point that we can't recognize it or something like that. Right. Or we reject it. So that's Dawkins being actually in line with philosophy of science that can, yeah. you can change in the next few years. So from an Islamic point of view, if someone believes, like if you take an orthodox approach that there is no common ancestor, because that will go against the whole idea of, you know, Adam having no parents. Or there's, yeah, um, although some would argue there's ways to, un, to reconcile that, but Put that to a side for a moment. Say you take the kind of mainstream orthodox understanding that you can't reconcile common ancestry with the Adamic narrative. There's no problem for a Muslim because you could distinguish between the kind of metaphysics and the physics here in a way. Because you're fine, I believe the Quran to be true and it's a true narrative. And um, yeah, I may be a scientist, and uh, yes, Darwinism mean to be it seems to be a, a mechanism or a theory that is well confirmed, has great predictive power and it has a lot of confirmations and it's mm. a successful theory, but I don't have to be a realist on it. I don't have to say that this is, this is exactly the picture of what happened, but I can practically accept it. I don't have to accept it philosophically or in my creed you know, or my belief system, but I can use it as a model to develop antibiotics and save lives. And as God says, saving a life is like saving of humanity. This whole kind of, oh my God, you, the scripture has to be in line with Darwinism. Again, it's a very weak philosophical approach. Well, the Quran isn't supposed to be a science book. Neither is the Bible. Exactly. So. Exactly. exactly. But obviously, from a Quranic perspective, if there are unambiguous statements that represent reality and we can't have multi layers of interpretation, there's only one, we'd have to go with that for sure. And even if there are multiple layers and we still can't reconcile, you have this very robust philosophical position, which is or rational position which is god has the picture we we have the pixel yeah even if you're a realist theories are not necessarily 100 percent true they still can change so if there's a friction between revelation and, and the world confirmed theory well revelation for you has a high epistemic status no problem but i can still accept the theory practically and use it because i know things work will give me good stuff but I don't necessarily have to believe that the thing that is working at the moment is actually absolutely true. But I could still be a scientist and use the framework of Darwinism to produce antibiotics and I'm saving lives. So I, I don't see this as a problem. It's just been, a, it's made into a problem because of clashing, clashing epistemologies, I think, and not understanding, you know, I don't know, maybe not being mature about the whole thing. People thinking it's a weapon to bash religion. It's, to be honest, not really, it's not a problem at all. For me. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I find it's kind of a, a false dichotomy to kind of put the, I guess, using science to disprove or, or to even indicate towards the divine is, is, is kind of asking the wrong question, because the divine is quite literally beyond the material realm. And so to use material apparatus to investigate it is not really the right idea um theoretically speaking anyway um so just before we close off because i'm sure it's been three hours or something like that at, at this point it's fl flown by um, you know what I, I would love to speak to you again by the way because it, you've got the best out of me i think and it's, it's, it's sometimes like i did a podcast myself yes i think it was yesterday and i was yeah. in your position and 
I, I don't know. I, I just felt that I didn't have the ability to get the best out of the guy. But you have a natural ability to get the best out of people. I think she was good. Oh, so I would I really enjoy us unpacking many issues in the future for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's just so we many. Should, we should do. We should do. We should do that Kraus thing. Like it'll be really good. That might go viral because it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's, got many, it's got millions of views. That thing and yeah, and to yeah. do to, to literally do a critique critique of me, not of Kraus. That would be powerful. And I really yeah. want to do that anyway because. You know what human beings are on their journey. Like if you look at my social media over the past 15 years or something, I've made some crazy mistakes, right? And hopefully I've shown people that I've gone on a different journey as well. So I'm gen- generally quite nice on social media. I'm a nice guy. I try and be empathic, understand context. But before that, you know, I was on a journey and uh, even the things, you know, I, sometimes I look back and I cringe, man. <laughs> my kids use that word. That's so cringe. Yeah, so yeah. I look at myself and, 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 and cringe a bit. I think it's probably a good sign because if you don't look back and cringe at yourself, maybe there's been no progress. But I want to do that as a service to the community, both the atheist community, the agnostic human beings in general, to let them know that, yeah, I made some mistakes. I would have improved on this. This was silly. This was wrong. Blah, 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 blah. And just give that as a service to people to say, look, this is how I would upgrade the discourse in certain senses. Because I have a duty of care because, you know, when you're in a position of leadership and this is some type of some form of social leadership because you have influence, um, you need to tell people what you've done wrong and how you should improve it. But anyway, go on. You said before you close. You, you come across as a, as a human being, which I think is, is the best possible outcome of, of what you could do or, or come across as you know, because a lot of people might want to just kind of push it behind them and 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 uh, not address it. But I feel like in your book and here and in other sort of videos, you, you are very open about about the certain mistakes that you might have made. And and to me, that's you know, because I you know I've got videos from like I don't know two years ago or something, and I just had a very low resolution idea of what I was talking about and. Mm. And you know that is that that is irritating to me. But at the at the end of the day, to me, it's progress. You know, and and I guess mm-hmm. that's the it's a gift, but also a curse to have yourself. <laughs> um, I don't know, cremated in well, I don't know. It's frozen in time, whatever whatever word. Um, frozen in time because you can kind of go back and learn and, and see see things. Uh, I so uh, d- when I mean because. When you were talking to um, Mohammed Hijab, you, you were kind of <laughs> well. He joked around saying you're on a what is it? You've retired <laughs> or something from from debating. I, I I do want to ask because I do think you know everything that you said today and and your insights are, are well worth. I mean, I know that you that you have this, the Sapiens Institute and you do obviously write and you do these things, but um, are you are you thinking of? debating Harris at some point or talking to Jordan oh, Peterson or there's a, history, you know. there's a history with Harris actually many years ago and it's a good thing I didn't debate him because I was not in the position to do that anyway. maybe <laughs> maybe yeah. and this was a few years ago now uh, maybe eight years ago I don't really remember I think it was before Krauss uh, or maybe just after um, we had a Twitter exchange or he was called in to a Twitter exchange then after we ended up emailing each other and he said, look, I have a debate on you, a written debate, though. We'll have a debate on, you know, he wanted to talk about apostasy and laws and stuff like that. Right. I said, look, this is not my view. He said, look, I'm very well grounded. I could give you all the schools of thought or whatever on this issue. So look, you know, these things are dictated by our philosophical foundation. Let's discuss. I said, look, he said, no. I might remember, he said, no, discuss with me these issues and they could lead to the philosophical stuff. I, at that time, I didn't want to fall for that trap. It would have got really messy based on his narratives at the time. But he seems to have, you know, slightly amended his public uh, persona. Yeah, I would, I, look, I'll have a discussion with anyone. If you want to ask people that you know to discuss with me, I will. But it would probably be of this nature. You could make it formal. I'll make it formal too. But when it comes to the Q&A or to the crossfire, I'll be as authentic as possible and conceptual like this to try and inspire what I think should be the truth. And that's it. I mean... I'm up for it. I mean, in actual fact, after the Krauss debate, not many people wanted to debate me anyway. I remember when there was a debate arranged in South Africa with a, an academic there. He agreed, but then when he found out it was me, he, he pulled out and started saying all nonsense about me on radio or whatever. You know, I don't know. I mean, maybe times have changed. You know, they've probably seen my persona change as well. 
you know, I'm supposed to be a PhD student now and I wrote a book and I need an organization. So they probably think that, you know, this guy's not going to be naughty. He's got too much to lose or whatever. Right. Um, but hopefully I think my persona has come across as authentic enough to show that, look, I'll have a discussion with you. If I don't know something, I'll say, I don't know. I'll give you my conceptual analysis of it. Uh, if I think it's true, I'll tell you it's true. And then I may respond to your point, but let's move on. So I do definitely want to engage with other people. But again, it has to be at the right time in the right place for the right reason. I don't like using debates and discussions as, as something intrinsic. They're just instruments. They're, 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 it's, it's, it's a means to a goal. Yeah. For the audience. If that goal, yeah. yeah, if that goal is good for the audience and even for the interlocutor, 100%. But if it's just debating for the sake of debating, it's going to be like Hyde Park, man. I yeah. love Hyde Park. Yeah, there's some good yeah. in it, but there's some like, oh my it's God. It's a bit messy. Yeah, it's a bit oh, messy. It's, it's, like a, it's like a drama show, isn't it? Yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's yeah. like, what is the point? Like, you know, I remember there was like uh, debates happening just for the sake of it. And they gave some ideas seriousness that shouldn't have been given given like five minutes but just because you have that mindset of yeah I'll debate anything and you know that's like a projection of your ego mm. um but yeah so absolutely anyone cosmic rationality rules Dawkins Harris and if it's not a topic that I'm good at I wouldn't take it of course yeah but if well I, I think I think you should reach out uh, because I'm sure that they that they that they want to talk to you I mean I, I when I when I was um you know revisiting your your stuff like you know your your debate with uh Lawrence Krauss and I, I was very surprised because as I said the first time I watched it was years ago and then I mean throughout the you know throughout the years I've revisited revisited but when I did a recent one I was like where are your discussions with like you know loads of other people like how because to me I I was just genuinely surprised that you weren't in engagement with with Harris again or, or you know at all or or um uh, Matt Dillahunty like I, I was surprised and I'd just love to see I mean yeah I mean like you say I do agree that if, if it was for me if the format was like cross-examination kind of like a conversation as much as a conversation less of a formal debate then that's my preference as I've said before well, I know and a I, guy I know I know a guy you might know him um, I think it'd be really good to maybe facilitate that on his podcast. His, his name's James Bergman. <laughs> uh, maybe you should arrange something. It'd be a good conversation. Yeah, why not? Why not? It'll give you a podcast profile as well. Say, look, I know Hamza, we had a really good discussion. Why don't you come on board and I facilitate a conversation? Maybe you could do that. If that's your project that you want to pursue, then go for it. Uh, that's my way of trying to empower you, you know, get, you, <laughs> get, get these conversations going. But yeah, look, no, I think yeah. they do need to happen. Islam Islam is seriously not talked about enough. It's, it's ridiculous, actually. I mean, the, how many debates, as I said, Hitchens, like there's only one uh, uh, Tariq uh, Ramadan that's one. Um, I can count them on my hands how many like um, engagements, uh, you know, of debates has been Christian versus uh, Muslim, Muslim versus atheist. Like, I mean, prominent prominent people in this field i mean it's just it's unheard of um and to me that really wasn't helpful for me learning about islam because the way i learn is you know through reading and through watching debates and i, I just didn't have that many to go off of um so i think it's something that we need more of i mean the one with cosmic skeptic and Muhammad hijab you know just more more of that just more islam more of those discussions um and and by the way, I also want to. Uh, I would, if you were to write <laughs> another book, this would just be my preference. I, I would love to read um, a book that you write on why Islam is true, and why Christianity and Judaism isn't, and even why polytheism isn't true. I think that would be a really cool sequel. Well, there's to, a really to your good book. book that's written by one of our academics, Dr. Osman Latif. He wrote a book called Divine Perfection. And in okay. that book, it's all about the conceptions of God between uh, between the Christian conception, the Islamic conception, and it focuses on forgiveness and love, because um, you know the likes of Craig and others, they say you know the concept of God is more inadequate because God in Christian tradition is maximally loving. What we do in that book, we totally destroy that argument, in my view, and we say not really because 
uh, God is not maximum loving in the Christian tradition for all of these reasons. And we say God is maximum loving and forgiving in the Islamic tradition for all of these reasons. And we start with the Adamic story, the whole concept of the inherent sin, who was a fall from grace. God couldn't forgive him, must be something external to the relationship, a blood sacrifice. But we're saying, well, in the Quranic story, it's not even called a fall from grace, it's just a slip. And not only that, they don't, they don't even ask for forgiveness directly. God turns to them, teaches them words of forgiveness, and they say those words, and God forgives them which is phenomenal it's a different reality of forgiveness it's very personal direct intentional and for you to be maximally loving you have to be maximally forgiving but in the christian tradition because of atonement because of blood sacrifice because of the wages of sins deserve death because of the so-called distance and holiness of god any sin even though he created a human being that was weak and would sin mm. any sin would destroy the relationship uh, he can't forgive directly. There must be an external thing outside of the relationship and a blood sacrifice, which is not maximal forgiveness at all. Therefore, how can you be maximally loving? Because forgiveness is a language of love. Even basic on that Adamic story, Islam basically solves the problem of what is a more forgiving, loving conception of the divine. But there's much more in the book. You could download it for free. You could have it on Amazon. It's just on print price only. We don't get any profit from it. It's called Divine Perfection by Dr. Osman Latif. That book is a phenomenal book. I, if you study it properly, you'd be like, wow, wow. And, and you'd understand really the, the lies. I, I mean, I don't want to call it lies, but the mischaracterization by some Christian apologists on the Islamic concept of God, and even the mischaracterization of the concept of God in the Christian tradition, this whole kind of uncon unconditional loving Lord is actually, if you look into his Christian mainstream theology, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's just not true just by virtue of the inability to forgive directly. And that's just one point, but there's mm. much more. To add. Sounds like an, it sounds like an interesting book. Yeah, because... Yeah, Divine Perfection. You might you should even have him on, have him on, have him on his uh, postdoctoral research. Uh, he was a PhD in history. I think he's a research fellow at Royal Holloway. He also now entered the uh, areas of dehumanization and othering. He's been published by Springer and Brill on dehumanization okay. and othering. Um, yeah, he's one of the leading academics on othering and dehumanization. So he, he's an asset for our community, but also for humanity because he, yeah. he writes really well. He writes really well. Um, yeah. So Divine Perfection, download it or get it from Amazon. It's cool. uh, that yeah, one. For sure. Yeah. No, uh, you know, the, the last thing I would have asked would be for book recommendations, but I think we're, <laughs> we're cool on that front right unless there's any any others that you would wholeheartedly recommend that you haven't mentioned but i feel like you <laughs> a fair few books have been flown out uh in, in the air yeah so um hamza i can't thank you enough for for talking to me uh it's it's been no, a it's been a, it's been a while pleasure. and it's it like, hasn't like felt like it the, yeah it's been two in the it's two in the morning for me now nearly oh god <laughs> We've almost done four hours. To be, it hasn't felt wow. that long to be honest. No, it no, it really hasn't. It really hasn't. I, there's just, there's just, you know, so much I wanted to ask, and and you know, your answers just been so in depth, and and very appreciative of that. We should do this another time for sure. Yeah, and then the Krauss thing as well. That that'll be that'll be very interesting to to pursue. Absolutely, yeah, it'd be cool. I'm at your service, my friend. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, happy to have you on. All right. Well, until again. <laughs> All right, I'll see you. Thank you. Bye.